Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever the case may be. For all of you listening out there across the crazy planet Earth, welcome to Vestiges After Dark. And I am your host, Bishop Brian Willett, coming to you live from the deep woods of Western Georgia on this May 9th, 2023. Tonight, we talk about a brand new subject never covered on this show before, Feng Shui, and we have wonderful returning guest, Natasha Venter, back to discuss it. It's going to be an exciting time, and we're going to be able to even look at your home environments. You can call into the show and get advice as to how you can improve uh, the flow of chi within your home. It's going to be a really exciting time tonight, but first questions from the ether with brandon milam don't go away Welcome back to uh, the show, the season. Uh, I know we've been out for the last uh, couple of weeks. I was out of the country, actually finally enjoying myself after a very, very busy Lent and Holy Week. Um, I try to go away in the Easter season, but because of, you know, all of the craziness of the last three years and the misery that is air travel, um, I wasn't willing to really do it. I was actually having more fun at home. (laughs) But now that things have normalized, and I can assure you travel is quite normal now um, and uh, quite busy, um, we were able to finally uh, go and have a proper vacation out of the country. So it was wonderful. We went down to the ABC. Uh, it's Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao. Um, three wonderful islands. Perhaps they, I would say they are the, the jewels of the Caribbean. Um, perhaps the only other island I would include in that would be um, Puerto Rico. I absolutely love San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, but uh, I will say, you know, the Caribbean, some parts of it can have sketchy sort of um, areas and whatnot. Um, not so in, in, uh, in the ABCs or at least not as much. I I would say that, uh, I felt completely comfortable just walking around aimlessly like a tourist, uh, looking for Cuban cigars, uh, which I found in abundance and authentic ones too. I found a wonderful tobacconist by accident in Aruba. Ah. Uh, I was walking, um, looking for a restroom, uh, and, uh, couldn't find one to save my life. Finally got to the casino and went in there. But as I was looking around that area, I found a tobacconist that had only Cuban cigars with, um, you know, certificates of authenticity. Um, so I was very confident buying them. And then when I finally uh, had them, um, you know, there's that sort of, they call it Cuban twang that only Cuban cigars have. And when you have a really good one, um, you know it and you, you can tell, you know, there's just something about Cuban cigars that no other cigar has um, when you can find one of the good ones that are authentic. Because the problem is Cohibas um, are notoriously um, counterfeited and um, because they fetch a high price, particularly the uh, legendary Esplendido, which I was able to obtain two of. Um, and it's not cheap. They're $144 for one cigar. It's a Churchill size. Um, and it's my favorite, or it was my favorite cigar up until 
um, I went to this tobacconist. So we went in there and I bought my two Esplendidos. So happy I found them, put them in, you know, put them in my box with everything else I was buying. And she comes up and she goes, how about the, the Padagas? And I said, okay. I mean, she says it's on sale today. And I said, okay, well, I'll get some of those. And so same size Churchill, you know, got a few of the, of the Partagas and there were only $40 a cigar. And so went back to the ship and had the Esplendido. And I said, it's good, but it's not quite as good as I remember it being 20 years ago. So I don't know if the quality's changed or my palate's, palate's more sophisticated. Changed, I think sure. my palate's changed. Yes. Yeah. I think you're right. And so we eventually, uh, the next day I had the Partagas, the $40 one. So literally four, uh, well, $104, you know, cheaper. <laughs> and, um, it was so much better than the Esplendido. <laughs> I really wish price I had. Price isn't go. always the. I'm uh, telling you. Oh isn't my god! Always the way to go. No, well, pr pr price doesn't really mean anything when it comes mm -hmm. to things like the finer things in life, like cigars and 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 whiskey, scotch, you know, right. wine. It can be one factor, you know. Certainly, if you're buying something for ten dollars, a, a wine for ten dollars, you can't expect much from it. A but. Headache. A headache, perhaps. A headache. But, um, you know, just because a wine costs $1,000 a bottle doesn't mean it's better than a wine that costs $50 a bottle. What you're paying for is scarcity, rarity, uh, name, um, you know, some kind of legend about it, that kind of thing. And the Esplendido, because I think if I recall, the, the Cohiba Esplendido is a cigar that was commissioned by Fidel Castro. It was his primary cigar that he smoked. When you see him in the pictures, the, 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 the legendary pictures of Fidel Castro, and he's got a cigar in his mouth, it's an Esplendido. So it has sort of a legendary Cuban status because of that. Um, but I can tell you right now, Particus is making a far better cigar at $100 left, less a stick. So um, uh, next time I'm in the Caribbean, Particus is what I'm going to get. I'm, I'm, I'm done with the Esplendido. I'm never going to seek them out again. Not worth the price. And the Particus is so much better. Anyway, I had a wonderful time. Very restful. Um, and I'm happy to be back here. How are you doing, uh, Jamie? Keeping the fort down, I hope. Yes, I'm doing well. I had my parents come in for a week, and uh -huh. we had a pretty good time just relaxing, did some cooking, um, took them to the wildlife safari oh. down on Pine Mountain. How was that? If anybody's ever been there, George, <laughs> it was it was hilarious. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so you have all these, these animals that are in an open... Uh, closed enclosure, uh -huh. and it, it's it's several hundred acres. Yeah. And uh, you, you can drive yourself through or you can get on a bus and go through. And they have vehicles you can uh, rent to go through. So we did that. And, nice. Um, that sounds fun. We, we, I got bit by a zebra. And, you got um, bit by a he, zebra? <laughs> it was an accident. He didn't try to bite me. I was Whoa. trying to push his head out of the van so I could move forward. And he got my forearm thinking I was giving him food. Oh, really? Oh, my, so he was my just dad, trying to eat. My dad was molested by a water buffalo. So uh, well, that's, that's we, we, we spent the entire time, I'm going <laughs> one mile an hour to get through, <laughs> laughing our asses off. And um, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was it fun. It does sound like fun. It well, was fun. Hey, the, the animals were awesome. I hope that, you know, you've recovered from, from Holy Week finally. Like, yes. yeah, it's, it was relaxing. It's, it's, it's definitely necessary. I think Easter needs to be one of the, my primary vacations going forward because it's just, you get so stressed out trying to do all of these liturgies. And I know that, you know, they're, they're, they're supposed to be relaxing, but there's also a lot of administrative work involved. So <laughs> yeah, I, I still need to de-stress. I'm going to the beach next month. There to, you go. To Amelia Island. And I haven't seen the beach in 12 years. So well, it's time. Be, it's time. That's going to be good. Yeah. It's time, I think. And we've got yeah. the gift that keeps on giving this gift from, uh, father Chris yeah, is father, our I think, whiskey. I think father Chris did something to this because this bottle, it does not, it forever. does not end, it, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, you know, cause it is a very good whiskey, but, uh, this is our, uh, our, our liturgical libation tonight. It's this, it's, uh, Do you, you want know, a Jamie dram or a Bishop? I uh, just, a just a Bishop dram tonight. Yes. Okay. I, I, Half I've been dram. drinking all week, so it's time to kind of give the liver a break, give the liver a break. Calm <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what you do at sea in the Caribbean. You drink rum, you know, and oh, so heck it's, yes. yeah, that's what you do out there anyway. Okay. Let's get right, started guys. with tonight's show. Well, actually first, before we even do it, let's, let's do a little cheers. Well, skull. good to be back here. Hmm. That's a damn good, Still damn good. good dram. Still yeah. good. It is. It is. Um, and speaking of drams, you're going to get a kick out of this story. 
Uh-oh. So um, we went to the duty-free shop to a pickup. To, As you because, should. Because there are, there are um, editions of scotch uh, whiskey that you cannot buy in Scotland, nor can you get at a regular liquor store, nor can your li- regular liquor store order them. They are special international travelers editions only. Ooh. And so anytime I go, anytime I'm out of the country, I make it a point to go to the duty-free shop so that I can look to see if I can get some of this for my collection. And as you know, my collection's quite extensive. He, he's got a he's got a collection, folks. Uh, I've got a collection. Like legit collection. <laughs> and a lot of them are not open. Some of these bottles are extremely rare, extremely expensive. Um, but duty-free stuff, unless you go traveling out of the country, you can't get this. So I will always go looking to see what new editions are available and try to pick up what I can. I mean, obviously you can't get too much because you've got limited space to bring it back, right? Um, but you want to, you know, pick those bottles that you've been looking for. So they had a wonderful uh, McKellen Lumina, uh, which is, uh, yeah, you can, it, it can range from about three to $500 a bottle. And nope. the, the duty-free shop had was selling it i kid you not for 131 dollars a bottle okay i might have i might have gone the extra expense for that yeah i mean it it was a hell of a deal and they had three bottles left and so i went and um i i grabbed i I went into the on the first day and i went in and i said you know um what do you got and i said well maybe i'll get it on my way out because i didn't want to have to deal with it and he said well then it's not going to be here if you wait that long he says this will be sold today and he wasn't right he he wasn't kidding he wasn't kidding um so i i said okay um i'll grab it i'll take it so i went ahead got the bottle and they hold it for you you know and that way you don't have to deal with you know kind of like disney kind of like disney (laughs) so um on the day two days before we were uh starting to head back i get a call and they said, uh, uh, Mr. Willett, where, where, um, I wanted you, you to be aware that you are going to see a, a refund on your account for $131. Um, your uh, McKellen Lumina was accidentally smashed. Oh. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Oh, wow. And so I'm, I'm kind of pissed at this yeah. point. And I'm like, well, what, you know, what the hell even happened? You know, and... Um, and so he, he basically, you know, it was one of those things, an accident. And because there were only three and they did all sell that day, oh, mine was the one, one of the ones that broke and um, there were no replacements. So they gave me my refund, but I still, it didn't sit well with me. So I went back and I, I kind of raised holy hell over it. I mean, I was kind of like, you know, there needs to be a better procedure in place because when somebody buys something that is rare, um and 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 difficult to obtain and very expensive uh relatively speaking um you know at least value wise this was a really good deal but it is a 500 hundred dollar bottle in some places and i said um you know you really should have a, a much more careful process so that this is not something that can even happen you know this is well, really kind of unacceptable the, the police offer detective in me is thinking maybe one of their buddies wanted it. That's what we were they thinking. they didn't break anything. They yes. sold it out from under you because somebody knew somebody and wanted it. That's what that's we... That's just me. That's but, what we were thinking. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's still possible, but when I went back You'd and think I... think they'd be more careful with you, such you a... You would think. Yeah. You would think. When, you know, when, when we went back and I and I raised hell mm-hmm. and, and, and Tracy was upset too, um, he, he, he basically came over and he said, um, you know, I think what happens he just says you know we're all working here day in and day out and it's just merchandise to us it's just stock but he says we forget that you know people build emotional connections to these things they're gifts they're treasures true, true. Yeah. and he says i think we forget that and we can get careless and something like this happens it's not a big deal to us but it can be a huge disappointment to somebody on holiday like yourself. And so he says, I feel terrible about this. You're absolutely right. You have every right to be upset. And he says, I really want to make it up to you. So he goes in the back and he comes back with a 
very much more expensive bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. Okay. And gives it to me okay. free of charge. Um, and so I thought, what a hell of a nice gesture that was. I, and I so, rescind my prior comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he did that for me, and we, we, we went ahead, and, and uh, I, we have another uh, uh, international trip planned uh, later. And, um, and my, my father-in-law um, is, travels regularly to Norway because the home office to his company uh, is out of uh, Norway. And so he's up there at least you know, once a month or so. Um, and when we were coming back at the airport, um, we walked by the duty-free shop and uh, sure enough, um, there were a, quite a few luminas on the mm -hmm. shelf. Now you can't buy them unless you're going out of the country. So you can't really, you, it, we couldn't go in there and get it. But when he's out of the country he could pick one up for me and oh, so he yeah. says he's going to look for one and then our next trip out of country we will see if they're still available but uh he'll be going i think sometime next month so i have a good chance of getting the lumina and then you and i can enjoy that because that was supposed to be liturgical libations tonight well but. i would love i would love to be guinea pig <laughs> you're gonna like that one Not if we can get it if we can get it okay let's Not get started here with this show Alrighty. today. all right we've got brandon milam how are you doing tonight brandon hey, brandon doing pretty good uh, my week hasn't been as eventful as yours, Jamie, but it's been pretty good. You didn't get bit by a zebra? No, <laughs> no, no, just, just working. I'm just adding that to my resume. <laughs> you didn't get bit by a zebra. What's wrong with you, Brandon? Why weren't you bit by a zebra? I mean, for goodness sake here. <laughs> hey, ne next time I go to a zoo, I'll, I'll let you know and record if I get bit. Okay, make sure I'll, you stick I'll, your I'll finger that. out, you know, extra, extra, you know, right through so that they can... <laughs> get a good bite on there to be know. fair he was just as surprised as i was <laughs> only you would get bit by a zebra i mean he only didn't mean you. to bite me our <laughs> eyes locked he opened his mouth i pulled my arm out and i'm like that was rude and i kept it moving <laughs> too anyway. funny too funny okay what's our first question for tonight so the first question comes from jackie and it's probably a question every protestant has so um as being raised Southern Baptist, we were taught to only pray to Jesus and God himself. I'm trying to adopt and understand praying to Mother Mary and who and what else to pray for and for what means to pray to different saints and whatnot. Can you recommend a book or explain it to me who to pray to and for what reasons to pray to others? Okay, it's a good question, um, but we need to clarify some things i think first because um there is something inherently wrong with the question and that is that catholics do not pray to saints um that is a colloquialism it's a it's 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 kind of a vernacular but what when a, when you hear a catholic say pray to this saint because for this pray yeah, to saint me. anthony because you Literally. lost your keys yeah. or something um they're not saying to pray to the saint even though they say that they really shouldn't what you're at what they're doing is they're asking the saint to pray for them so it is no different than when you go up to your uh, brothers and sisters at church and say i'm having this tough time or some so but somebody's in the hospital or whatever could you say a prayer for them no, nobody would have a problem with that. But, you know, uh, for some reason, a lot of Protestants have a lot of difficulty when it's, it's, most, it's a saint. Growing up as a Protestant, that's what we thought and what we were told. Told that they pray to saints, right. yeah. And it's because they use that terminology. They say, pray likely, to yeah. St. Anthony for, you know, your, your lost keys. Pray to St. Jude, you know, for this hopeless situation. And, and that's not what we're doing. That's not what Catholics do, okay? They're asking for the prayers of the saint. And, and, and this is why it's important to understand because to much of the Protestant world, saints are just dead people, yeah. which is, a, again, an inherent problem with their theology because there's nothing more alive than somebody that has entered into the presence of God, has entered into the kingdom of heaven. That is the highest expression of life possible. You have yet to taste life the as a living. Church triumphant. Absolutely. You've yet to taste life. But those in heaven have finally experienced what life really is. You've never, you, what you call, what this is, is just slow dying. That's all you're doing right now. It's just slow dying. 
You've been dying since the day you got here. You have not entered into life until you enter into the what the church calls the beatific vision, the presence of God. Okay, um, so the saints are right there. The, 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 by by the definition of a saint in Catholicism, a saint is one who has made it, one who has entered into the beatific vision, one who is in the presence of God, one who is in the kingdom of heaven. And this is referred to as the first level of the church, the church triumphant. Triumphant because they have succeeded in attaining the kingdom. Okay. And that's significant because, um, you know, what would have more impact? Now, this is a crude analogy, but it's a way of trying to explain the ineffable to people who do not understand the ineffable because we're limited in our human capacity to understand these divine things. So I'm going to give you a little analogy. It's not a perfect one, but it at least will help you. What's more, what would you think is more beneficial? So you've got a major problem and you need help with that problem. And there's a person who can help you. And this person in this case is God, but let's just pretend it's a, just another person that has a lot of uh, power and ability and resources to be able to help you overcome your problem. Would it be better to send a little letter and say, hey, can you help me? Or try to call his secretary and hope that he calls you back? Or would it be better to talk to somebody that you can access directly and say, um, hey, you work with him. <laughs> you're you're in the boardroom every can you every, put in a good can, word can for you, me can you go and can you can you tell him that i, I you know I, I i need some it's always better to go directly now you get the protestants that will say but you can go to god directly of course you can but you can't go into god in the way that the saint can because you're not in the beatific vision you are not in the kingdom of heaven you have been separated by the fall of man you have been separated by your sinful nature and that limits our access. We have to be made perfect again, which is kind of the process here that we're trying to get through and what the church is here to help you accomplish. But um, we are not in the same position as the saint. So the saint is kind of like on the board of directors. <laughs> and if God's like the CEO, then the saints are the ones at the table with him. And if you can talk to one of the one of the, the uh, board of directors and say, can you put in a good word for me? That's going to have a lot more impact than if you just send a letter or, you know, try to make a phone call. It's not a perfect analogy because God is certainly more accessible to us than a phone call or a letter, but not in the same way that it is to those who are already in the kingdom of heaven and are perfectly united to his will. So getting the prayers of the saints is a very efficacious means of having one's prayers heard because they can pray more perfectly than you can. And that's why you do it. Because we do, even the scripture says, we do not know how to pray as we ought. That's, a, that's scriptural, okay? There's no, there should be no disputing that in between Catholics and Protestants. <laughs> it's right there in the Bible. We do not know how to pray as we ought. But the saints do because they have been perfected and they are in the perfection of God. They are part of the perfection of God. And so getting their help is very efficacious because of that. And they are still part of the church. They are the church triumphant, the first stage. We are known as uh, the church militant because we are fighting out our salvation. We're fighting against dark forces. We're fighting against our own sinful nature to win the, the the kingdom okay so that we're considered the church uh, militant and then uh and then those that die but are in the state of being perfected not ready for the kingdom because there's still too much uh, too much imperfection but they died before they could completely resolve it buddhism has a similar thing to this in terms of karma it's not quite the same thing but it's along the same lines but in catholicism you know if a person dies in there they haven't you know been perfected in life, which is going to be most of us, I hate to say it, yeah. um, then there is purgatory to make that possible. Purgatory is this condition upon which we are then perfected so we can then enter the kingdom of heaven. Everything, everyone in purgatory is saved. It's not, you know, as Protestants sometimes think purgatory is like getting saved after you die. That's not 
That's not <laughs> Christian theology. Um, it, you're already saved. It's just you're not perfect yet. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven imperfectly. And so, therefore, um, that's the third stage of the church, and that's the church suffering. Why is it suffering? Because they can see the presence of God. They understand it now, but they can't have it yet. Um, and, uh, and then uh, it's also understood that the purification process is uncomfortable, not because God wants to punish you, but because um, we don't like having to break our attachments. Att- growth, breaking Growth hurts. Growth hurts, and attachments uh, losing attachments to things are painful, but you have to lose them all. And this is again, you know, when you compare it to Buddhist theology, it's 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 a perfect match. They just have different ways to explain it. Um, they talk about karma instead of sin, but I mean, it's in in reality, it's 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 all kind of the same general idea. Um, so that's the, that needs to be clarified to even answer the question. Um, so you know, that's what we're doing. We're asking for the prayers of the saints, so we're not praying to them. Um, now, as far as what books to get, um, any any hagiography that you pick up uh, on saints, and I'm sure Amazon has countless ones. Um, there's a one, well, there's ones, I think, by the Catholic publishing company called The Lives of the Saints, and it goes through the primary saints for each day, because every day has, the, it's the feast day of countless saints, but there's usually one primary saint that dominates the day and um, it, it will tell you a little bit about their life. And um, sometimes it will include what they are the patron of. And, um, but we shouldn't look at saints like, um, you know, magical amulets, uh, amulets. You're not, you're not, you're not trying to contact saint because, you know, oh, do this if you, you know, if, 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 if you need money and do the, you know, pray to this one. If, if you lost something, pray to this is kind of missing the point. OK, the, the, the patronages are really just about um, uh, other people talking about their faith accounts while how they prayed for the, the, the help of the saint and the saint came in this special way to help them. Um, and thus you get things like St. Anthony helping you find lost things, which really does work, by the way. I've used it many, many times, and I have I've an interesting... Yeah, I have an interesting story if you guys want to hear it later. Um, I'll even tell you about it. It's a little bit long, though, so I won't get into it now. Um, but at another time, maybe we can talk about how St. Anthony's prayers were uh, answered. Um, I mean, my, you know, asking for his prayers. Was uh, I think he felt sorry for you. I think he did. <laughs> I, felt, I felt sorry for me that day. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, so any hagiography that you pick up should have something like this. There's no one book. But the li- look for the lives of the saints. Just type in the lives of the saints on Amazon. I'm sure you'll find a book that has that information as far as like Holy Week and all that and the things of the Catholic faith. I mean, you're just going to have to get a book on Catholicism. And I would say get a Catholic encyclopedia and read it from cover to cover. If it's really something that is interesting to you, then that's what I would suggest you do. Get an, an, a Catholic encyclopedia, get a, a an, an extensive one and read the entire thing. And, uh, believe me, by the time you get through that, you'll, you'll know everything you need to know and more than you thought you wanted. So, um, that's all you would really need to do, um, to really understand this stuff. I mean, the Catholic faith is not as complicated as it looks. Um, it seems elusive and complicated and mysterious to those who are not raised in it. But, um, you know, those of us who are cradle Catholics um, are amused by how people look at the Catholic faith and see, see, and they look at it and they see, it seems like it's such this, this, this crazy, mysterious thing when it's really not. Um, it just seems complicated because it's new. Um, but there's plenty of resources out there. Uh, um, Jamie, you, you have a, an idiot's guide, right, that you, you like. Yeah, you, you dum- read it. Dum- yeah, Dummy's Guide oh, to that's Catholicism. It. Yeah. yeah. Did, uh, did it include things like the... The, the feast of holy week and stuff like that did it, it talk did about? it did cover it it even did uh some uh, orthodox eastern orthodox see it did that too so yeah the the dummies series of books they're they're worth getting no matter what subject you're interested in they have a book for it trust me yeah so the idiot's guide or whatever for dummies there you go yeah. so that's all you got to do um if you know those are things that are of interest to you and you want to learn more about the catholic faith um that's what I would suggest, but it's very important to understand we do not pray to saints. No Catholic does this. No Catholic 
thinks they're doing this. It's right. always for asking for their purse because they are closer to God. Okay. They're closer to God than we are. And so there's something very efficacious in that closeness because that's what we're trying to attain to ourselves. Okay. There you go, Brad. I'll go ahead and actually add to that. Okay. Um, sometime last week, I got into this uh, debate with a Protestant and we got on the topic of Catholicism and praying to the saints. And so he asked for clarification, uh, do you mean people that have already passed on? And I said, yes. Then he said, there is no biblical basis to pray to or with dead saints. But they're not dead. <laughs> dead is what we're doing. The, the dead, see, understand theologically in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the dead are those in Sheol. Not those, not the, 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 those in, he in heaven are not dead. They are the ones that are truly alive. We're on the, we're on the precipice. That's what life is. It's the deciding factor. It's your last chance. Do you, do you side on the favor of the will of God? Well, then, you know, then you enter into life. That's why Christ doesn't really refer to it much as going to heaven. In fact, he never even says, oh, you're going to heaven. I mean, he will refer to it as ushering in the kingdom or my, my, my father's kingdom, that kind of thing, you know, but when you really look at how often Jesus refers to it, he's actually referring to it as eternal life. That's how it's actually referred to. So it, to say dead people or dead saints is, is, is a misnomer. It's a contradiction. We're the dying. Those in hell are the dead. And those in heaven are the truly living. So, um, it also sounds like a sola scriptura kind of thing. Well, well it's it, not in the Bible, so. Well, it, it's like, and that's the problem. It's that when people say things like this, you better damn well make sure that you actually know what you're talking about to use the Bible in such a way and to speak with it authoritatively. Um, you know, you better make sure you actually know what you're actually talking about. And, um, so that's already by by saying dead saints, dead people. That's that's completely contradictory. There's no, there can be no such thing. There is no. You wouldn't be a saint if you're dead. <laughs> Only the living can score the title of saint, um, and that's why we are not saints. There's no such thing as a as a saint here on this earth, because we're not living. We are dying. So you get the living in heaven, the dying on earth, and the dead in hell. That's how it works. So no, you don't pray to the dead. Of course not, because the dead, I mean, the hell, those in hell can't save you. They, can't, they couldn't save themselves. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, 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 the individual that, that asked you that question is clearly confused, Brandon. I would say so. Uh, <laughs> so there. <laughs> just, just, yeah, I yeah, ended up having to unfriend, block the person. It's just, yeah. Now, see, you should be able to have debates and disagreements without having to block each other. And, and it, whatever happened to debate, Bishop? We know when we were kids, we had debate teams in high school okay i'll tell I mean, you what it was great you, you want to know mean, what happened to they debate don't teach it anymore you want to know what? you can disagree with someone and it's okay i'll tell you what happened it's it's the it's it's the continuation of the everybody gets a trophy mentality right right that's where it comes from i'm telling you right now because um i'll, I'll tell you look after i graduated uh with my undergrad degree uh i thought for a very small period of time that i wanted to be a teacher because I do actually very much enjoy teaching. Yeah, that went through my head like 30 seconds. 30 and seconds. I was like, no. I well, for me, it was a little more than 30 <laughs> seconds. Like, no, it was more like be, a year. I wouldn't be a very good teacher. But I wanted to do it. And so when it came time to enter into graduate school, I started with a degree in education. And I actually completed it. I just didn't get, uh, I wasn't uh, awarded the master's degree because I 
didn't complete student teaching, which I hated so much I couldn't even conceive of it. Um, be, and I'm speaking the politics of the school system is what it was. I yeah. actually enjoyed well, it teaching hasn't gotten the kids. Any better, I can tell you that. No, and it's much worse. And I could see the trends. But while I was in this uh, graduate program with education, we had this, you know, teaching methods class, and it was, you know, t- again, just as it sounds, teaching you know, methods, methodology for teaching children in various ways. And one of those was, um, you know, talking about uh, how to utilize debate strategies to teach. Like, in other words, you give um, individuals competing positions and then they have to research those positions. And as a result of the debate, everyone then learns the other person's research. Yeah. It's a fun way to learn and it's enticing. So he wanted to demonstrate this because everything in research and teaching methods was a demonstration. So um, we became sort of like the young kids and he was like the, the, the school teacher and we were sort of role playing through this process. And so what he wanted to do is do a debate on evolution. And remember, I went to a non-denominational Christian school. Um, Palm Beach Atlantic University is a non-denominational Christian college. Um, it's a very respected one in the state of Florida, but uh, it is it is a private uh, institution and it is a Christian-focused um, college and with Christian-focused program. So, of course, um, a lot of the particular, uh, well, student body as well as the faculty there do not believe in evolution. They are creationists, which, as you know, I am the furthest thing from. I am absolutely, well, I'm I'm both, honestly. I believe, uh, yes, I believe God created everything. I believe he used evolution to do it. (laughs) I have no conflict with that. And honestly, when you look at the, uh, the, the, the foundation, I guess, to, um, well, when you look at the foundation of, of, of evolution as a, as a, as a, as a theory, um, it doesn't have any contradiction in there. Even the Catholic church agrees with that, you know, so even the, the Vatican has not had a, you know, does not see a conflict there, but there are evangelical Christians that do. And so I immediately jumped at the chance. Oh, I want to be the, I want to be the one that, that, that debates <laughs> evolution. And of course, the, uh, the, my opponent was more than happy to bring in the Christian perspective. Well, it came down, long story short, came down to debate day. And do you think you're, anybody's going to beat me at this debate? No, I mean, it's just not going to happen. And so, um, you know, they, pre- they presented and he, the teacher obviously was favoring the other side because, uh, you know, there was the Bible creationist uh, position and I had the secular evolution uh, position and uh the the uh, my opponent gave out all these bible verses and everything else and i came back and i refuted it with things like vestigial structures like the appendix the uh um the uh, wisdom teeth um the, the the fact that all uh, mammals, Pineal uh, gland. yeah, well, all mammals have, uh, basically when you look at the, at a, at a, at the development of the embryo, you can ba- you can't really tell one from another. We all kind of form, we all start out looking the same, looking the yes. same and we all have a tail, even human beings. Yeah. So, you know, why would we have a tail in the womb? Um, if evolution wasn't part of our, you know, our answer. So I, 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 I mean, I, this was a long debate. I can't get into all of my points here, but needless to say, um, I, I crushed the opposition and the teacher said, Oh, Oh, that was a really good point. You know, I don't think we need to continue this debate. You both win. You both win. You can't both win a debate. That's not how a debate works, but it's, it's again, it's this thing where if a person's ideology is challenged and God forbid, you have to now stop and think, Oh my God, maybe I'm wrong maybe I'm wrong about what I think I believe. Um, that takes a lot of maturity. It takes also a lot of courage. And we're not, we don't teach things like maturity and courage anymore. No. We teach our kids to be babies forever because, you know, we don't want our kids to grow up. And, you know, we keep pushing it off, pushing it off. You know, you're, you're an adult at 18, year old, at 18 years old, but you can't drink. You can go kill people in war, but you can't drink a drink. 
Um, you know, you can't even rent a car till you're 25. Um, you know, we, we want to make kids babies forever. And they, what are you going to do when you treat kids like babies? Well, they stay babies. And that's why you have immaturity problems all the way into their 30s and 40s. This is why this still happens. So th that's the first thing. But the other thing is it, we don't teach courage either. We teach people to be afraid of everything. The last three years was proof positive of that. It, it was all about fear tactics. The yeah, whole damn thing. We started on that with the active shooter training we did in law enforcement. Yeah. You'd go to these seminars where they're teaching people how to survive, mm -hmm. but not one of them taught to fight back. Mm -hmm. It was always run and hide secure. It's like, no, find a weakness and fight back. Yeah. Because yeah. these people are cowards. Yeah. They're going into gun-free zones for a reason. They're effing cowards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it's frustrating. We, we are not teaching yeah. uh, courage anymore. So and that's kids why. Kids aren't learning it, and you have what you have today. And that's why we can't debate because you can't god forbid you challenge someone's ideology and they have to stop and think and say oh my god i'm wrong <laughs> and you know maybe we can add a third category in there humility is also something we're not oh, teaching god yes people are arrogant about Be what humble. they believe yes they're arrogant about what they believe they're arrogant to a point where they can't even hear another position and we see this with politics all the time um, and so, you know, try to debate someone today in politics and all you get back are cowardly, uh, arrogance is all you get cowardly arrogance. It's a show for their, for their flaws. They know they're, you know, it's, it's, it's just the way that it is anyway. Um, a long answer to what is, sounds like a simple question, but it really isn't. <laughs> no such thing here. No, not really. No. I, so our second question comes from Moreno. Okay. Uh, her, her question regards Matthew 27 verses 51 through 54. Okay. She asks, I was wondering how this passage is to be interpreted. My mind kind of goes to the resurrection at the end of time, but then it goes back to the centurion and the other soldiers seemingly seeing the events. So I'm not sure how to understand this passage. Okay. Well, first let's read that verse. So uh, Matthew chapter 27 verse 51 says, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Also the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now as for the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the other things that were happening, they became extremely frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. So this is an important part of the um, post-crucifixion uh, because it is uh, the it, it's it's actually one of the active elements to what is known in the church as the harrowing of hell, and remember hell as we understand it in the Dante's Inferno. Um, eternal punishment sense did not exist. That was an invention of the Middle Ages. Hell was Sheol. Uh, in the Jewish people and the Greeks had the same equivalency. Um, they just called it Hades instead, but it was the same thing. And it was, wasn't a place of punishment. It was the abode of the dead where simply you enter into this drifting uh, into un unconsciousness. Eventually it's just, you drift into nothingness is essentially what it amounts to in the end. And I still str strongly stand by that that is what hell is even to this day. In all of my explorations um, in the paranormal and mysticism and religion, I have never seen any evidence for the existence of a place of eternal punishment. But I have seen the deterioration of, of spirits. I have seen the degradation and the, uh, well, you could say the decomposition of spiritual energy. And um, basically, it's, a, it's, it's an annihilation of sorts. Um, and that is hell. And I guess you could say that's eternal punishment because um, you had a chance to live and you chose not to. Um, and uh, there's no coming back from it once you're broken down. So <laughs> so um, there, that, that is essentially how the early Judeo-Christian theology understood hell. Okay, So hell, Sheol, Hades were all the same thing, none of which were a place of eternal punishment where there's all these devils there to torture you. That is a modern... Uh, well, modern to the extent that it was a medieval invention 
um, about a thousand years after all of this was written down. Okay. So that's important to understand. So essentially what it, what they're, what's happening here with the harrowing of hell, because Jesus descends into hell, he goes to Sheol. And why does he do, do that? This is in that period of time between Good Friday and, and Easter Sunday. Okay. Um, what he's doing on Holy Saturday, which is what the church is honestly celebrating on Holy Saturday, even though it's not really celebratory, it's very solemn. But uh, what he is doing in, in Sheol is liberating the righteous who died prior to the benefit of the crucifixion. So nobody could enter into the kingdom of heaven prior to Jesus coming. Jesus is what sets us free, opens the gates of heaven again that was closed to us. That's why the veil is torn in two. And that's why these two verses, these two events are combined in this uh, passage from scripture, because the, 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 the veil is, is what separates God from man. And nobody was allowed in the, uh, the, the Holy of Holies, except for the high priest once a year. Um, but when Jesus comes and dies, it is complete. That's what he means. That's what's meant by it is finished. Okay. It is no, we are no longer separate from God. Now we can return to where we belong. We are now one with him and we have access to the kingdom again. Okay. And so what he does is he goes to Sheol to rescue those who die, who are righteous, who died and they ra they are raised from the dead. Okay. They are raised from Sheol and there are those that saw this happen according to the gospel of Matthew. Um, and that's what's being seen. It's a precursor to our own resurrection because Christian theology teaches that all of us, both the righteous and the unrighteous will rise from the dead at the end of time. And, um, um, and then that's when that's what judgment day, you know, but it's not really about judgment. It's more about consequence and, uh, <laughs> what you choose. Remember, no, but God doesn't send anyone to hell. You send yourself there. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. I think that's something in particular, at least when I was growing up, we weren't taught that God doesn't send you to heaven or hell. It is by your choice, by your doing. Right. We, we were never taught that we were taught God either sends you to heaven or how there's no in between. There's yeah, no that's how most of us were raised in the Protestant, which uh, makes no sense because yeah. uh, again, I would tell such people read your scriptures, read the Bible. Why aren't you reading the Bible? Um, Jesus uh, makes it very clear uh, that that's not how it works. Um, and honestly, it makes more sense. Of course, it does because what what kind of what kind of vindictive God right. would come here to save you only to destroy you anyway? Yeah. That doesn't even make sense, and that's not the kind of God that we have. Uh, you know, that's what kind of, what what makes God what makes Jesus even more important than he already is is the fact that he teaches us about the love, the loving nature of yeah, what, what God. Parents, what parents going to have? You know these threats to their children. I'll love you only if you do this or do that. <laughs> yeah, well. You love your kids no yeah, matter what. Yeah. So. I think what it is is though that, that that's the way they actually parent and they think that God parents like they do. Oh, that, that's scary. It is scary. But, you know, we have a screwed up world and that's why. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, uh, again, more, you know, people teaching authoritatively things they don't understand. All right, so our third question, uh, <clears throat> can spirits read our mind? Um, spirits? Well, spirits, yes, yes and no, okay? No in the sense that, that a ghost in your house cannot read your thoughts, okay? However... We can um, facilitate what is like essentially a telepathic communication with spirits, but we have to be willing to do that. Then they can communicate with us in that same way, but they cannot read your mind. There's a difference between telepathy and mind reading. Uh, spirits are capable of telepathic communication because that's the only way they can communicate typically. I mean, sometimes you can, you know, you get the EVP and all that stuff. 
Um, you know, so there's uh, there are physical ways in which they can try to reach out to us. But um, speaking from one mind to another is essentially easier for them. And but the problem is it's not easy for us. And unless we have a uh, natural mediumistic ability or talent, um, which all of us to some degree do, but not everyone is as tuned into that as, as others, um, then it's going to be more of a challenge. So yeah, they could, they could try constantly to communicate, send a message to you, but if you're not hearing it, um, then you're not going to hear it and they cannot read your mind. Um, that's just not how this works. And even angels cannot read your mind. Um, say for God himself, yeah, God can, you know, knows exactly what you're thinking and what you're feeling. But uh, he's the only one that does. Um, even Jesus himself um, w- was not a mind reader. Um, that's, that's, that, that's something that is reserved for God the Father. Uh, and, and, of course, facilitated through the Holy Spirit living within us because we're part of the divine nature. And that's how it's not really mind reading even in that context. It's just more of the fact that, you know, one nature to another. But, um, you know, no, spirits cannot go around reading your minds. Demons cannot read your minds unless you open yourself up to them. But they are good at tracking you and watching your habits and, and that's why people think activity yes. and so they'll stalk you yes it's just like a, a predator it is a predator a predator stalking their prey they're going to learn your weaknesses and then take advantage of it exactly and that's why people think they are reading their minds because they're just such astute observers so they're sitting there watching you some and patient too they'll watch you for years some of these um yeah, cause time is nothing to them evil spirits yeah I mean, time means nothing at all to them. It doesn't even really mean anything to us. We just have created the the construct of it um, and have put much importance into it. But uh, time is all we really have, and um, and there's there's more of it than we could possibly ever utilize. So, uh, you know, these evil, um, intelligent creatures like fallen angels are capable of of uh, well, they understand this intimately and and they utilize it against us. So, yeah, they will watch you for years even, and uh, it will eventually, when they make their move, feel to you as though they read your mind because they know you so well. But they don't know you because they, they, they're, they're invading your thoughts. They know you because they've been watching. Um, and that's you know why you don't want to have uh, these things attached to you because that's kind of how they do their thing they weaken you over time but no any spirit no matter how sophisticated cannot read your mind but they are capable again depending upon how sophisticated and telepathically communicating so higher the higher the sophistication the more effective they are at this and some really high level spirits can even facilitate it so that you can they can bring you up temporarily to their level to have a communication um, so angels notoriously are capable of doing this. If there's a message that needs to be sent and you're just not hearing it, God will sometimes send an angel to force you to get the message. Um, that can happen. All right. It's rare and it's not going to be something that most people experience, but it is something that can and does happen. Um, and that's, you know, again, because of the sophistication, the spiritual sophistication of such a creature as an angel, but uh, a low level elemental is not going to be able to do that. So there, you know, that's really all there is to it. Right, so that pretty much answers my question because I think the other day my mother was watching a show where a medium said something on the lines of the spirits could read her mind or something like that. And my mom looked at me, she said, is that true? I said, I don't think well, so. Well, a medium, let me double check. I mean, a medium can make that kind of arrangement. I mean, they can leave themselves permanently open. Uh, some do. I think it's a bad move, but I mean, uh, some do it. I've seen it. And this is why it's kind of dangerous to go to a, uh, an arbitrary tarot reader. You really need, if you go to a psychic, you need to make sure that you know, you need to vet them and make sure that you know you're going to someone ethical because uh, they will, if, they, if they're the kind of pe- a person that leaves themselves open, then when you go f- and there's that exchange of energy between you, the quarant, and they, the reader, you can start picking up whatever they've been And we've had clients, up. remember, that, that have come from 
a psychic reading and they, they got an, an yeah. ugly attachment that yeah. he had to break. And this is how it happens because yeah. these psychics don't know what they're doing. They're not as skilled as they think they are. And they, they don't close up. They don't close the session. It's just like a Ouija board. Okay. Uh, you know, Patty Negri, right. Um, we're, we're, we're good friends with Patty Negri. She's been on this show several times. You've seen her on ghost adventures, um, along with me. And, um, she has absolutely no reservations about the Ouija board. You know, she uses it regularly. I've used it with her. Okay. I've actually done a session with her and, um, but she knows how to open it and she knows how to close it. And she does so every single time. Right. She doesn't just, you know, arbitrarily play around with this. I would never use a Ouija board and haven't since I was in high school. But with the group we were with that night, I felt completely comfortable. Yeah. Because I knew it was being it was being utilized correctly. Well, and that's it. It's it's like anytime you do any kind of um, spiritual work, you need to make sure that you're taking the proper uh, precautions, um, particularly if you're not doing something that is. Um, a, a, what I would call a, a spiritually sanctioned activity. Yeah. Okay. So this is why the church condemns things like mediumship and, and, uh, and, and tarot cards and psychic readings and stuff like this, this is why the church condemns it. Uh, a lot of people think it's just, Oh, you know, they're, they, they're, they're ignorant. They think it's all you know, anything that's, it's all demonic. No, that's, that's really not what it is. They're just having to err on the side of caution because that's their job. Okay, they're not going to to tell you, oh, it's okay, but you got to do this, 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 and this. And as long as you've done this, 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 and this, then it's safe and you can use it. Um, because the church isn't in the business of teaching you how to close <laughs> close open doorways to the spiritual world. That's not what it's there to do. Um, they're just going to be, just avoid it. Don't even get involved in it. Plus the fact that, let's face it, okay, People that have less than honest intentions spiritually are typically going to seek out alternative methodologies because there's less regulation there. You know, um, they're going to get kicked out of a a monastery doing shit like that. (laughs) The church isn't going to have them. Okay. But you can go up, you can go on the side of the highway and open up a, you know, Madam Catherine psychic, uh, you know, uh, uh, extravaganza and do palm readings and no one's going to regulate that. No one's going to tell you not to do it. As long as you buy the business license, the government doesn't care. All right. Uh, at least in the United States, there are some countries that do regulate it, but not here. Um, so there you go. Um, that, that, but uh, so you can have unscrupulous people doing this. That's the problem with it. So you need to make sure if you're going to use a psychic and I have no problem with you doing so. I don't believe in controlling people. And, um, you know, I'm not somebody that says you have to be cautious with every single thing. I don't believe in fear tactics. And I think the church sometimes does. Um, I will not practice such a method. But I will say if you're going to get involved in alternative spirituality, which can be sometimes dangerous because people don't know what they're doing, just make sure you do the vetting. Make sure whoever you get involved with does know what they're doing. And that can be a a challenge. You know, you got to really trust. And I think that's why I have this show, you know, because part of what I'm trying to do here is try and teach you how to do things like vet people. And and I try not to have guests on this show that uh, are questionable. I don't think we've ever had anybody, at least on this show, maybe on my podcast in the old days, uh, on I This Year, we had some crazy ones. Uh, we had some good ones, though, too. I'd love to bring some of them back. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it is about being careful, making sure the people you're dealing with are ethical people and that they're, that they're working within the light, so to speak. Um, you know, that's important. But uh, yeah, I mean, there you go. So um, let's go ahead and take our top of the uh, hour break. And when we come back, we've got Natasha Ventner back. Yeah, let's get into it. Talk about Feng Shui and Brandon, stick around. I'm sure you'll have some great questions for her too.
everybody to vestiges after dark we're getting ready here for the second part and now we are bringing on our wonderful guest natasha ventner to talk about feng shui she will also be here to answer questions that you might have about your own home environment and how you can improve upon the energy in your home and if you want to talk to her about this so that you can give a good description as to what's going on and how you she can help you improve it you'll want to call into the show the number is 718-362-6380 that's 718-362-6380 remember to enter pin number 855-4111 to get placed into the queue you can go ahead and go in there now we're not going to be taking questions right now uh, but when we go to calls it'll be first come first serve so call in now so that your call is the first one answered okay we'll be back in just a moment
All right, everybody. I'm really excited about this uh, because this is a subject we've never covered before. And for those of you who are new to the show or maybe not seen Natasha's last appearance this season, Natasha is a gifted intuitive and, psych uh, intuitive and psychic who has dedicated her life to guiding others through the challenges and uncertainties of life. With her natural born psychic abilities, she has become a trusted advisor to many, helping them navigate the bumps along the road of life. Her unique abilities allow her to easily travel to any lifetime dimension and the Akashic Records, providing a bridge between worlds. Natasha is a gifted dimensional animal communicator and a reader of energies her work is focused on lovingly assisting people through grief and other challenging times with over 30 years of experience in the field natasha has honed her intuition and developed a deep understanding of how to help people her readings, healing meditations, life coaching, and feng shui consultations are all designed to enlighten and inspire her clients. Natasha's lifelong dedication to her soul calling and her commitment to helping others make her a valuable resource for anyone seeking guidance and support. Let her expertise and caring presence be the light on your path towards a more fulfilling and joyful life. That's why she's here, and we are so pleased to welcome her back to the show. Hello, uh, Natasha. How are you welcome doing? Welcome back, today? Natasha. Well, thank you for having me. It was such a gift to be here last time, and I was excited to be here again because you guys we are love just having magical. You. Oh, thank you. You are magical as well. I mean, that's, you know, I really enjoyed your last conversation, and uh, it's not easy to find somebody that is uh, experienced in feng shui. So when you mentioned it, when we talked to you with you last time, I didn't know when I booked you for the first show that you were also um uh, knowledgeable in that arena so i thought wow, you gotta come back on and talk about right. some of your other areas of expertise because there's so many and i don't think we're going to run out anytime soon so i think you need to be on next season too <laughs> <laughs> well, i appreciate that yes um i my dad was a multitasker i mean he was a chiropractor he was you know but yet i've also seen him you know in you know on boards with a water in a basement working on electrical you know what I mean? <laughs> right my yeah dad sounds like my dad that he yeah. And, and, you know, he could, you know, take out motors, put that motors back, you know, it was like one thing that he knew about doing multiple things. And I just grew up with that. Yes. So it's like, for me, it makes sense why I can do so many different things because it's all about energy. Yes. But at the same time, you know, I'm grateful. And I want to kind of just snip into what you were talking about at the end of this at the last hour, you know, because there is a lot of spiritual people out there that are not spiritual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I really appreciate you saying, you know, go with the morals and the ethics because of the fact that, you know, I'm, I give my tools away a lot. You know, I work in the elementary school system, so I support people, but I go through the back door. I use, um, you know, I, I really don't push people into my belief system. Right. You know, I say, you know, Hey guys, you know, I just want you to know you're loved. You know, I support them, you know, whatever I can do to do the work I do. But then when I sit down with the client, that's when I, that's when the exchange of, you know, the benefit of, of monies or the, you know, that exchangement is because it's a business atmosphere, you know, type of thing. But I've had people come up to me and say, Oh, you're a psychic medium. Let me, I, I, I'm like, stop. <laughs> yeah. Just stop. Yeah. I don't want your credit card number. I don't want to know about your life. This is not a business moment. You know, I, you know, just stop. I'm not going to, I don't want you to open up to me because that's not fair to you. Right. You know, that's not who I am. And so I'll sit down with you for, as a business, I'll sit you down as a client. I'll sit down with you because I want to support you. Right. But at the same time though, this is not the place or the time. Now I have had messages that I need to give somebody, Yeah. but that was discernment. You know, right. I used discernment with that and I let the universe tell me if it was meant to happen or not. Right. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think the real challenge that I find in the years that I've been, you know, working in and out of this field and I guess the field of metaphysics or the field of, mm -hmm. of the paranormal, all of it kind of gets blended together anyway. And religion, of course, as well, you know, it's in there, it's kind of built into it. Um, the one thing I, I say, what I see the most is just, is the dabbling. It, it, it's, it's just people that are just playing around because they're curious. They want to have an experience. They want to play. And, um, and then that's where the real problems begin uh, and where we tend to end up 
coming in as exorcists. Just to go on TikTok. Resolve. You'll, I mean, apparently there's a whole lot more witches than we thought. Well, but, you yes. know, and, and then they have their infighting. Um, it, it, a lot of it, you know, it, it opens up a doorway to to try something new, something different. But you've got so many people that just read a book and now they're a experienced, you know, witch or conjurer. Well, that's the danger of it. That's the danger. It takes years of experience. In, mm-hmm. You know, to become a priest, for example, you know, of course, there's going to be unscrupulous groups out there that will Always. just create a certificate, sort of like a diploma mill kind of thing. And, you know, you just put in your details, you pay them 50 bucks and they send you a ordination record that's legal. Um, I think Universal Life Church Univers- does I was that. Say Universal Life and Church. they don't make you a priest, but if you want to declare yourself a priest, they're not going to stop yeah, you. And I, I mean, think they'll they, even put it on the certificate. You get too. To marry people. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but if you're going to, you know, be a legitimate priest, you have to, you know, have the laying on of hands. A valid bishop needs to do this. Mm-hmm. The proper rites need to be performed. And uh, no bishop that is ethical is going to ordain somebody to the priesthood who has not at least gone through some kind of formation program or process. The danger is that a lot of these alternative systems like witchcraft, for example, are not inherently bad, but you can go to the new age bookstore and pick up a book and self declare and, and just say, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm now a witch, you know, practice witchcraft and I'm going to do this book and it's like a self initiation. And, and that I, I do have a problem with that. I do too. Um, I mean, I, I, I've read multiple books on shamanism and animal speak and I would never call yourself. Cla- a shaman. I would never <laughs> claim to be a shaman. Right. How disrespectful. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. so it, it irritates me when, when people read a book and think they can just dive in. Well, it's even, even like, I'm, I don't know what you feel about this, Natasha, but I mean, even with, um, with Reiki, yeah. um, you know, there's like, you can do this, this weekend online very, very course and now call yourself a Reiki master. I have a real problem with that. That, I mean, that, that's not a mess. I, I do, I do too. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's mainly, you know to you know to kind of step in here is is that because it's all about energy yeah and yeah. i even get people who are five years maybe reiki masters yeah and they're saying i just allowed the energies to move through me i asked their energies to move through i go stop <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know yeah. it's like you know there's this this process i mean my dad was a chiropractor so i learned about energy growing up yes you know and he even said that's their energy yeah, you know, right. even though I was a conduit, there were, like he would get maybe an 80 year old that wanted, and I would be the muscle tester for him. Yes. You know, I'd be the conduit muscle tester. So I knew how to move my energy with their energy, but yet I never allowed it to be in me. Yes. You know, yeah. I just allowed me to be the conduit, you know, the, you know, this is them, this is how the answer, you know, type <laughs> of thing, you know, it was interesting how I played with it. And, you know, we got to be careful about that we you know, do. because it is time, even though I, was and and has always been intuitive you know since the minute i was born sure i had to practice how to use it in my humanity in my humanness you know and that takes time it really does take time it does and 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 a a refinement of skill is even those you know I, i kind of liken it to playing a musical instrument you might be naturally gifted but um to become a master pianist or something like that you still need to go through some kind of formal training to get there. Um, mm. You know, you'll, you're never going to ever reach that level of potential unless there's some kind of refinement of skill. However, that is, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go through some kind of, you know, doctorate in music or something. It just means that there needs to be some kind of refinement, some kind of perhaps mentorship pro- process where, you know, you train and study under somebody that is more proficient than you are. Uh, uh, I think that's important for religion in particular, um, regardless of which one one practices or any kind of spiritual discipline. Um, but speaking of energy, that's what Feng Shui is all about. So it is. <laughs> I guess, why don't you tell us it's how you segue. got involved Ooh. in, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> why don't you tell us how we, how you got involved in Feng Shui? Because I mean, that's kind of an unusual 
discipline. It's uh, Chinese. Um, you know, it's very deeply related to Chinese medicine and Chinese philosophy. So, um, I'm curious to see how you you arrived there and 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 to the point that you do now what you do. Okay, so first off, I want to say though that I am not a master as people would call, you know, the practice. I did not go through like the master of schooling and all that kind of stuff. I learned feng shui through the practicality and I've been practicing it for almost 30 years. Okay. So I've really stretched and pulled it. I've done that. So I call my style of feng shui, the practical feng shui. Okay. Now I I put coins in certain areas. I know how to put frogs in certain areas and you know, that kind of (laughs) stuff. But, but when I go in and support someone, I go into their day to day life. So you're doing it as a, as almost like a supplement to your, to your core work. It's like, this is another, uh, a tool, a tool that you use. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So if someone is, let's say dealing with something, I went into a house and you know, she had sliding glass doors in her, um, health corner, you know, <laughs> in that health area. Yeah. And you know, I'm like going, are you struggling with energy? Are you struggling with, uh, with, uh, you know, just feeling kind of off You're feeling, um, maybe sickness that comes and, and taps on you a lot. And, you know, is there like even a form of depression, you know, that yeah. mental health, you know, is there, and she goes, actually, yes, there is. And I go, okay, well you have this like doorways and all your health corners, you know, and it's, it's, um, in the Bogway and we, we'll talk about the Bogway in just a little bit, but yeah. it's about how do we support the energy of the flow of the home so that you can rise up and be your better self. It's not the fix of a home of, of your life, but it's a, it takes away one of the blocks of your life because when you got the energy flowing, the energy can flow. And that's what the, it's all about the better health of our life. Right. You know, change your environment, change your world. You know, just like if you change the environment of your mind, you change your world. So you have to change the physical as well as the mental. And this is the application of the physical. And you can use it at work too, right? You Mm -hmm. could set your office in the same way that you would set your home. Exactly. You can, you, it, it, um, it, I sent you an email. I don't know if you're going to be able to share or not, but it, it, it's the Bagua of an area, a building, and, and it can, you bring it down to the Bagua of your desk, mm-hmm. you know? So it's, it's that, that, um, expansion or that, that, um, I don't want to call it small, but that, you know, intense, you yes. know, where you can make it, you know, I do even, even do my altars with the intention of feng shui. Oh, interesting. Okay. You know, and, and doing things like that. So you always have the ability to work with what the energies are going to be about. Well, I always get now, mystified when I go into like an authentic Chinese restaurant, I find all these square tables everywhere, you know, because, um, you know, I know the circular tables are very good for the flow of energy and, um, you know, it's, it's common to, at, at, really good Chinese restaurants to see, um, you know, all these circular tables with lazy Susans on them. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in the United States, typically, you know, everyone's got the rectangles and the hard edges. And so my understanding, and I mean, I want to say I'm very, my understanding of Feng Shui is very elementary. It's very basic, Mm -hmm. but, um, I understand that, that hard edges are not necessarily favorable. Is this correct? It is. Okay. So there is always something that we have to manage around. So when you have like those hard edges, you'll probably notice though they're in alignment with the flow. So they have them set up so that the energy is following those points and then going around. Exactly. In other words, and you'll find probably that, and they're called shards. So the corners are set in a way that they're not aiming at anything. I they're see. they're okay. more in a neutral way of of aiming. So you'll probably find that there is this scenario that's going on, but there that's the one thing about energy. There's always a fix. Yes. And that's one thing is how do you fix what you have? You know, like going back to the person who had the sliding glass doors or the windows all in their health. Well, we just put a talisman or they put something that would slow down the energy. You know, they would put something, you know, that would really be beneficial or like uh, in one area, she had like an, um, 
where she could put greenery in there. And I said, well, you know, put a plant somewhere in there so that it slows the energy down. Even though it was outside, it could slow the energy down so that it didn't necessarily go whoom, out. Because mm-hmm. you want energy to move, but you just don't want it to go, oh, I'm going out there. Yes. Oh, I'm going out there. You know, it's like you want it to kind of go, oh, I'm moving around to there. And then I'm going to keep moving. You know, so it's that that kind of energy. So I do the black sack type. It's the it's not necessarily the, the compass style. It's not the north, south, east and west. It's the, how do you walk into a room? How do you go into your property? And that's the way that I tend to do it. But because I find that a lot of times, you know, you can do the um, the like how I did my bed, I used the compass yes. style yes. because it was more at that time, my husband and I's relationship was so rocky that I really wanted to get down to where we could work through what we were working through. And so I knew that the placement of the bed was so vital to our intention because of the way our bedroom was. That's a real important one, isn't it? Having your bed in the right configuration. Right. Oh, it is. It definitely is. You always want to have your you want to, ha- if you can, have your bed to where your feet are not going out the door or a window. You know, I've and always you- intuitively never done that. I've always, I always put the bed, um, or the head of the bed uh, uh, parallel to the entry. I've always done that. Mine's always been uh-huh. facing north. My head to the north, my feet to the south. But where's I, your, well, your, how's your I door? Try not, I try not, my door is just off to the left. Where my feet would be. Yeah, and okay. that's okay. Just you know, if it's barely. Off. Like, if I rolled yeah, over, but, I'm in trouble. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it, there, there's no, like, I mean, I'm, okay, so I'm going to go back to this. That this I'm a practical feng shui. So, yeah. you know, it, it's like, if that's the only place you can put your bed, yeah. then you need to figure out how to mo- maneuver with it. So, with me, you know, I, I actually like where my bed is. And you want the bed to where, if you're walking in the door, you and you you can your bed is always to where you can see who's coming into your your bedroom absolutely you know like you always like your desk you always want to have your desk in the power position to where mm. you can see what's coming in mm. coming to you mm-hmm. right 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 and so for me where my bed is is that i have a window that's just outside you know at my feet but what i have is i have you know, some, I had put usually a plant there that doesn't have spiky energy or I have, um, I have like, I love dragons. And so I have like a statue of a dragon that is facing me so that the power is coming towards me when I'm sleeping. I see. And so I don't necessarily, and then I have a, a line of trees that are pretty solid, you know, that I can see. So it's not like my energy goes flowing out to an empty field. But it, it actually has some flowing, but I don't want it to go out to the trees either. Right. You know, I want to, I travel enough of my sleep already. I don't need to travel <laughs> you, more. Right? You don't need any more help, right? <laughs> sure. Exactly. Exactly. So with that, the, the, there is, the Bagua is the, it's kind of a grid that goes over an area. Okay, so the Bagua is something, and, and there's certain sections of that Bagua uh, that there's the, um, you know, the, in one corner, there's the helpful people, you know, there's another, and then it's like, there's a, there's squares, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I did send you a, um, an email that has one of those so that if you want to share that it's, it's a visual thing for a lot of people. So, so if you're walking into your door to the, to the very left, the right, sorry, dyslexic here mm-hmm. to the right is your helpful people. Okay. okay. And these are kind of like squares or grids. And then the next grid would oh. be uh, creativity and children. Okay. Then the next corner, the far right corner would be your relationship corner. Okay. I'm trying to bring up those images. Let me see if I can get them up on the screen so that we can kind of follow along with you. Um yeah. We're gonna we're gonna test this this out. Sometimes every time I try to do something crazy like this, we have like a problem. But we're gonna try it. Let's see if this. Well, works. Mercury's in retrograde, so I'll ask for the the technology people of of, of the spirit. Well, I kingdom thought we were coming out of retrograde. Out. Yes, let's uh, see if we can. <laughs> I know. We, yeah, that, it feels like you're never coming out of net in retrograde. It's like you're always I know, coming out. I know. It. Well, we had met Mercury in retrograde for two years in a row. First thing coming into the into the year, so it kind of tends to have that. Thing. Feels like. It does. I get, I understand that. Okay. So right now I'm going to try to put this on. It's going to be like, I'm going to just put it 
right over my face. So you can you can still see. Uh, Hi. <laughs> here we go. So there it is on the screen right now. Uh, hopefully, wow. those of you at home who are watching on YouTube, obviously the audio only version, you're just going to have to listen. But uh, hopefully, let me know in the chat if you can read yeah, that. There we go. I can see it. You can see okay. it. Okay. Yes. So, so whatever, wherever your doorway is, is to your, and then you're facing into the room. Do you okay. want the other graphic up there too? Let me put the other no, one. No, no, no. Just, oh, this, just this one. Okay. 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 This is fine. And so with that, so the, the very right side is the helpful people. So when you're dealing with helpful people, that's who do you want in your life? That's your friends, you know, like, um, that's who do you want to be supportive? Like for me, I have like in my bedroom, I have an, an I have a man with an angel sitting over you know, holding onto his shoulder. So that is, I always want support from my universal team. Right. Right. So I want helpful people. That's also a travel area. So if you want to go traveling, that's a good place to put, put that intentions, okay. those, those images. The next one is health. Or I mean, that's um, creativity and children. So that would be a good place to put your pictures of your children. That's where you would want to put maybe if you have guitars, if you have music instruments, you know, you can put them in that kind of area. Okay. okay. And then you have the next far corner is your relationship. Okay. Okay. And relationship, let's say in the bedroom, I have it mainly for my husband and I, I really, you know, I have a couple being married. Um, I have, um, you know, two dragon flies, a picture of two dragonflies coming together on, on a, on a re two reeds, cattail mm -hmm. reeds. So I have things that are coming together, pictures of something coming together. Now, like in this room, you know, I have um, relationship with angels, guides, and and different things. So there's different rooms you can have relationship intentions, right? Right. Yeah. And then the far when you're standing at your door and it's the far end of that, you know, the the furthest area right there. That would be your um, the the fame and reputation. So how do you want to be perceived in life? What is your intentions? What what do people see you as? Who do people see you as? You know, it's it's that um, it's not necessarily what you do, but how you do it. Right. Okay. You know, type intention. So that's where you could put maybe your um, your trophies and and things that you're proud of to be. I see. Right. Right. Okay. And then the the um, the far left corner would be your prosperity corner, your wealth corner. So that's where you would want to make sure that, you know, you have wealthy in, intentions there. Okay. Okay. And the far so left like corner. In, yeah. So like in my bedroom, I have, I got some cast iron pans and I have a, it's a chest that says discovery on it. So right? in the orientation, because you're not using the compass. So is the, how do you, how do you orient? What's the far left corner? The one, uh, as you walk into the room, is that how yes. it's decided? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so it's wherever not the whole house, it's not the furthest corner of the whole house. It's the furthest corner of the room you'd walk into. It, it, it's wherever you walk into. So I'll go back right. a little okay. bit, so but that, I wanted to room. kind of get the Bagua down first. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. okay. And gotcha. then, then that other picture that I sent you that has kind of the, the house, the yard, picture yeah um i can put that, that up will after. explain Wait. it a little bit more <laughs> okay let me know let me know when you're ready for that graphic and i'll get it up for okay. you okay so then that the health and prosperity corner is that you know you want intentions for how do you want to be prosperous in your life and then 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 the the next grid would be your um health and family it's amazing how our dna can trigger our health so how do we want to do that so if you're struggling with your health check to see if you have any broken pieces Especially if you're having problems with your back, see if you have like a broken leg of a chair or, or, you know, a picture frame that's not quite fit together, you know, mm -hmm. really look at what you have. And then the next corner is your knowledge corner. And that knowledge corner can really, um, 
influence who we are. Um, for like me being dyslexic, when I first moved into this house, I had my dirty laundry in my knowledge corner. Well, I found out that didn't help my dyslexia very much. So what did I do? I put my my dirty clothes with my clothes in my closet. And then I put my necklaces and chains and even for a little while, because I really needed to get my brain together, dictionaries in that corner. So I had intention, right? Right. And then um, where you where you walk into the room or to that that very south that in between, that would be your um that would be your uh, reputation and what you do. You know, how I, I do, you know, school, I do um, intuitive work. Who am I and what do I do? Okay. So now the picture that you have up now is that, that overall view. Okay. So if you're working on changing your energy of your, ha- your place, the Bagua gets big and then it can get smaller. Okay, so this is a picture that I drew. Sorry. (laughs) So you could do like you're saying, like we could do like the whole house, which would be like for the things that go in the top of the back left corner or the, 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 the back right. That would be like the whole house in that configuration. Or you could reduce it down to the room or even the top of your desk. Yes. That's what you're saying. Okay. I got you. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So, so like looking at this, that would be the far, the, the, the line that you see on the very outside, that Mm -hmm. would be the line of your property. Okay. Okay. That would be the fence of your property. So the Bagua would still fit over those areas, right? Right. Okay. And then do you see that it came down into the house? Yes. Okay. And it's the same Bagua. Right. 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 Okay. So now you have the kitchen, the front room, and then you have the bedrooms. Right. Right. Okay. And those bedrooms, if you notice that the Bagua shifted to you standing in the doorway. I see. Yeah. Okay. And um, I don't know if you can telephoto it in, but you know, it, yeah, it, I it, can. Um, it, uh, it shifts to that area. And then I even brought it down more to where do you see the bathroom? The bathroom, then you turn around and then you go in that doorway. It's, I know it's kind of confusing and it's, but yet at the same time, the once you get it, it's like, holy crap, this really makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, and, this, you know, this and, is really, and it really fascinating. makes a difference on your intention of where you have things, right? Yeah. So now looking at that bedroom, if you notice that at one door, so let me, let me go into the bedrooms. Okay, here we go. Let okay. me put them up. Right. So then the go. bedroom, so it'd be like you'd be standing at the door having the bagua. So where the door is, where the door is, is where you would be standing. So then, um, so you're coming in, your- you're coming in from that, that, um, middle left. So I'm looking at the bottom bedroom here. Yes. So you get so that you'd be standing basically in the, your, um, fame and, and, uh, or your career. Yes. Right? Okay. Okay, so you'd be standing in your career. So the at the right would be your helpful people. To the left would be your knowledge. I see. Okay. Right. If you're right. standing at the front door of your house, then that bedroom would be in your knowledge corner. Right. Okay. And then the wealth so, would be that top, the back left part of the wall as you come in. Yes, exactly. So there's areas of the house that can mean, you know, it has two different intentions, but when you match up those intentions, that's like a, the holy hoo-hoo of, of really make sure that this corner is, is set in that intention. So okay. you're like talking like putting some of those, those Chinese coins with this, with the little square mm-hmm. hole in the middle, you put, put, you would put that in that bo- ba- that back left corner. Of this room yes. to improve mm-hmm. the wealth flow of energy in that particular room. Exactly. I see. Okay. So what do exactly. the frogs do? Because uh, that's, that's wealth that? too, right? The frogs are well, about wealth. some frogs. I got frogs all <laughs> over my property. <laughs> because I know you see sometimes the frogs with a little coin in their mouth, right? Yeah. Yes. And that's, that's about abundance. So for okay. me, in my understanding through time is, is that frogs you put in the, in, um, as you're coming in your door, 
but you want the frogs to be facing inward. Oh, inward, so okay. Inward, not outward. Okay. Not no, outward. You want because you want to no. find you yeah. want your abundance to come in come the in. house. Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh. And you don't want them necessarily where you're tripping mm. over them either. You are you are um, flowing with it. So like mine is kind of tucked underneath the table where it can be in the flow, but yet it's not necessarily where I trip over it. It's not in the way. Do you, what about the cat, the, the, the cat with the raised paw? Do you, do you ever work with those guys? I do not. And I apologize. Like I said, I'm, I'm kind of in that, the practicalness of, <laughs> of not the know, superstition part. Well, in a way it is, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it, it is in that, that, that next layer of intention for me, when I walk into to someone's home, for one, they're just struggling to be alive right. sometimes. Yes, yes. And so I want to get them to that next level of support. So let's say we have an individual that nothing's going right in their life. Okay. They can't find a job. They're, 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 they're out of their, you know, relationships aren't working out. They're not happy. Um, what could they do within the means, I guess, of affordability? What could they do? to their home that would change that dynamic for them. Okay. So for one, because I'm, I'm assuming I, just to just, I'm assuming that that's going to speak to a lot of people out there because that's one of the biggest things that I hear people complaining about. What most people are depressed about is either not enough money or just really sour relationships. It's always one of those two things or both. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So what I would say is first go around and look at your home. Do you have empty boxes? Do you have um, do you have boxes with clutter with dust on it? Mm. Well, shit. Now I'm not a minimalist. <laughs> I am far from being a min minimalist. I uh, yeah, okay. I I do have stuff, mm -hmm. but at the same time, if you look at my stuff, things have a purpose. Yeah, clutter is not a good thing. Clutter is not a good thing. And like for me, I went through and did a 10 minute cleanup because I noticed that I had unfinished projects in my home, which meant that I had things in hallways. Well, hallways are about energy flow, right? Right. So what did I do? I went through and I put things home. I put things away. I put them where they needed to be. And that allowed the flow to happen with a cleaner moment. So if you're feeling stuck in your life, I would really look at what do you have stagnant in your life, in your house, in your home, in your room, especially in your bedroom, because of the fact that um, many a times in our bedrooms, we that's where we spend a lot of time. And if we have a lot of dust, dirt, empty boxes, clutter underneath our bedroom, our beds, we're going to be cluttered in our sleep. And we're not so we should not so like sleep. a lot of people like to store things underneath their bed. That's not a good idea. I uh, I would say what is the intention of of storing under the bed and what does it look like? Okay. What does it look like? Uh, and so with me, I have a couple things under my bed. But I really make sure that what I have has intention and it's easy to move. You know, right. it's not a, a stagnant thing. Right, so, okay. uh, so I have a very large rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was going to say for a long time, my husband had um, his guns underneath his side of the bed. Yes, I have a fifty caliber rifle. I keep under my bed. Is and it, I can and the, the intention that. is. <laughs> I get what the intention is. See, that's where I don't hold judgment because I, I, I like to work with what people have. Yeah. But at the same time, at the time that my gun, my husband had rifles underneath his bed, he was dealing with a lot of anger and frustration. Mm -hmm. So I asked him to move the rifles out from underneath so it would help him ease his frustration that he was going through at this time. Well, regardless of he how he was also dealing with alcoholism. So yeah. you know, right. there was a, there was a lot of the, those mixed messages that those guns could have. Yeah. That's a whole other. Yeah. Well, see, yeah. it's like, no matter what your feelings on guns are, we can't, everyone can agree. They're an aggressive symbol. They are. Exactly. So you don't want an aggressive symbol in your sleeping environment, or at least in range of where you are 
trying it's, to create create a environment of peace. Mine's the lower receiver. The upper receiver with the barrel is actually in the safe. So it's it's half a half well, a. It's a half a okay half, half okay well, half, 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 half the anger. Exactly. There. And, and, yeah, well, <laughs> and, and that's the thing is, is, yeah, and that's the thing is, is if you sleep on one side of the bed and the guns on the other, then that's also a a little bit of an ebb and flow too to ease that moment. Now. Also, you know? if you have something like you, like I'm going to mention your gun and you put maybe like, um, uh, like a, a feather, a bird's feather on it, you know, just soften the edge of it. Mm-hmm. That could, that could add a different intention to what is underneath you. Hmm. Interesting. That you know? is fascinating. So look yeah. at something or something like you maybe with a cross mm-hmm. or something that has sentimental um, enlightenment, um, peace, tranquility, then put something like that on it. Oh, uh, maybe I'll put a feather in the case. I have plenty of those. Yeah. So with that, the, the, there is this, this moment, it's not about wrong or right. Like for me in my marriage corner, I have two bathrooms and a septic system. <laughs> okay. So how do you deal with like, what, what do you like? How do you, I guess work with all, all the energy just because that mean that symbol symbolic uh, you know uh, the symbology of that is like <laughs> exactly. you know it's, like, it's all going down the drain. <laughs> well, can, it's not too I good. Can tell you, <laughs> shitty situation. Can, exactly. Well, I can tell you the previous co- cl- um, people who owned the house got divorced. Oh, really? Mm. Interesting. So, and I can tell you that that my husband and I for a couple of years did struggle with that. But what I ended up doing, and thanks, and due to my parents parents passing away, I had a little bit extra money. I can do this is that I shifted the door just a little bit so that the energy wasn't going straight up the stairs and over the toilet and out the window. You know, I needed to shift the door a little bit. I also make sure that, um, I had three, three guys in this house. I made sure all the toilet seats were down because I didn't want things to be flushed down the toilet and less purposeful. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And then over the septic system, it's an empty corner of my house. So I was able to have a huge roadie and um, a nice um, rose. And then I bought an arbor that, you know, had no corners to it. It was all woven in and made a room over the, the septic system. So I made a patio mm. and made it kind of pretty, you know, out there. And then I made it to where there was two seats also so that there would be an opportunity for two, two energies to sit in peace and tranquility. And so with that, that I shifted up that energy and put it as a purposefulness instead of as a negativeness. What do you do if you have more than one door to your bedroom, like more than one way in and out? That's where you use the uh, primary Okay, so whatever one, every, whichever one you use the most. The most. The okay. okay, so the main one. So this will be the internal because we have we have a door that goes out to our uh, to our 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 swimming pool, and then we have the door that goes into our our the whole the main hallway to the house. So, mm-hmm. um, but when you come in through the the internal door, um, the door out to the to the pool is to the left. The bed is to the right against the wall. Um, and then the window is on the far right, but straight ahead. So not exactly in the direct corner of the top, the, the, the back left corner, but the door to the bathroom is offset by a few feet. I'd say maybe about four feet mm-hmm. and maybe not three feet, maybe. Um, and so is it bad for it to be in that corner? Cause that's the wealth corner, right? That's so, the top left. The top left. Yes. Yeah. So that's where, corner. so close to it, not in the corner, but, but I'd say three feet to the right of the back, back left corner is the door to our bathroom. Okay. So then if you're walking into the bathroom a lot in and out of your well, your wealth corner, mm-hmm. that means that you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, that you're not flushing your wealth down the, the toilet. Right. Okay. So you would want to have something like, a, um, I would say like on, if you have a chance on that wall, um, you know, you have a picture that has something that has um, intention that kind of says, I'm here and I'm important. Okay. 
right? And then when you go into your bathroom, you feng shui that area as as your um, as the Bagua map. So if you have the financial corner, and then let's say in your bathroom, you ha- in the financial corner, you have a toilet. I would really make sure that that what is what that you have a toilet seat. Um, and then like for me, I have put something on the back of my toilet that helps with um, with prosperity. OK, there because it is the Does toilet is in the b- back left corner, too, of that bathroom. So okay. it's a double so whammy. I, it's it's the I back left sure. corner door to get there from the bedroom. And then it's the, the toilets in the back left corner once you're in the yeah. bathroom. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, so basically now, you know, those colors are the, the pinks and the reds and the purples, right? Okay. So then I would have something with those corn, those colors. And I would have something that, if you can, on and, um, above your toilet that you don't necessarily want to have flushed down but has the energy that kind of has – peacefulness like i would not put like a waterfall above your toilet right. Bad idea. <laughs> right. okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. then it would be fl- flowing down but like my um my girlfriend above her toilet put a, a picture of a of a very peaceful buddha okay you know what i mean and, yeah. it, and it was peaceful for me i have windows over my toilets but i have something like a, a stained glass in my window so it kind of has that energy of flow so so i'm not having the energy flow out above my toilet either there's a lot of movement i had actually a quite of a a freeway of energy yeah. <laughs> going up and down my stairs toilets and and everything like that and i really had to do some work with um it like in that hallway i've put um uh, like, uh, um, uh, ah, the word just went out of my head um, and dream catchers dream and catchers, yes. stuff like that. And, and, or, um, or chimes, uh, something to shift the energy. So it didn't, you know, escape, you know, so something that represents stillness or something that represents being caught like a net, you know, something of that nature. Exactly. You can even have like, um, I wouldn't necessarily have a lot of greenery because the colors aren't, but if you had like, like for uh, like a picture of like a, a, a plant that's blooming beautiful pinks and reds, okay, you know, that would be a good thing. So you have life coming out of the water. I see. Okay. Hmm. So it's really, okay. it's, it's really just about fixing, you know, improving on what you already have to work with. I like that. Exactly. And then make sure your toilet seat stays shut. Yeah. I, I, that typically is the case. You I got, you got that Mr. Mail. I always shut the toilet. Okay, God yeah, bless I do. You. I always shut God the toilet. Yeah. I don't like open toilets. You know how the guys are. Don't like open toilets. And because an up open toilet means that you have energy able to flush down your toilet. Yeah. Now there's sometimes where I want energy to be flushed down the toilet. Right. Right. But there's other times where it's like when it's just sitting there, I don't want it to escape. Yes. And you definitely don't want your wealth corner to have that energy. That's for sure. Yeah. Escaping. You know, you don't want it. it, It's that, you know, it's that. Why can't I ever get wealthy? You know, because it's always seeping away. Yes. You know that you can do things to slow that down and 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 shutting your toilet seat is part of that process. What about mirrors? I know mirrors are used a lot in feng shui. How, How do you utilize them? I have to be careful what I want to reflect. Okay. So for me, like on my front porch, I used to have, I live at a Denon road and I had a drug dealer that lived across from me on the other side of the road. So what I did was I put a mirror to where it reflected her energy, but I also put it in a very un- a forceful way. Mm -hmm. Like in other words, I put a rabbit in front of it or I put something that was softer in front of it so that she, she would get reflected back her shards, her negativeness. Yes. Without being me yelling at her with the mirror. Right. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Right. I didn't want to instigate her anger, but I wanted to, for her to learn her own lessons. I wanted her to, to have her karma keep coming back on her instead of being put on me. Sure. You know, and then in my um, relationship corner in my bedroom, I actually have a round mirror that reflects the picture of like the dragonfly picture and another picture that I have that says love, 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 all of it. Okay. You know, so I use that to reflect. So it's, 
um, it's, you know, a lot of people like um, putting wi- mirrors at their doorways when they're coming in, which is great, but stand in it and see what you're reflecting. Mm-hmm. So it's all about what's being reflected back. Exactly. Like I have, I had one house where I walked into and I looked in the mirror and all I saw was um, messy keys, mass, and, um, and basically like mail that was thrown on the table. <laughs> clutter. Yeah. Clutter. I, I'm not going to call it clutter because it's life. Right. But it was disharmony. Yeah. For what she wanted to do. Gotcha. So what did we do? We got a basket for her mail. We organized her keys that needed to be there and her masks she put down in another basket so they weren't primary. Okay. This was kind of in that switch over of COVID. So yes. we still needed a mask. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so that they weren't, they weren't primary in what she was reflecting. Hmm. Now I remember years ago when I did look into Feng Shui and I, you know, was getting kind of interested in it. I never followed through with developing a more uh, I guess knowledgeable um, state with it. But I remember there being something about rafters not being necessarily a good thing. It, it looks beautiful. Like when you go into a, a nice drawing room or, a, or a, a, a fancy living room, you'll sometimes see these, these straight beams. beams. And rafters. Yeah, well, crap. Rafters I live going. in a log cabin, Bishop. I have rafters. Do you have everywhere. rafters? Oh, yeah. But like straight oh, yeah. across? Yes. Now, I, 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 rem- I remember Support that beams. being problematic uh, from a feng shui standpoint. Do you, do you, could you shed some light on that or am I mistaken, Natasha? No, actually, now this is the way I see it because I'm an energy seer. I see how energy flows, the chi energy it's called. Yes. I can see how it flows through room. And, you know, when I see rafters and stuff, I see it flowing through the room, but I also see it stopping. Yeah. I love rafters. I love the look at them. They're beautiful. I would never own a house with them because (laughs) of the fact that I'm so energy sensitive that I feel like I'm getting cut off. So let's say if I'm sleeping with a rafter, I will try to sleep where I'm in between one rafter or another. Okay. Okay. Um, I have um, the gentleman that I do my show with on Monday, um, Regan, that he had rafters in his spiritual, in his room that he does his, um, his, uh, his work in. And what I told him to do is maybe get a ring of um, fairy lights and put them on the outside. So the primary energy is where the lights are because that's where your focus is. So it takes the focus off of the beams. Off the beams. You can also do, um, you can also do flags. You can, um, a lot of a lot of feng shui artists like to hang like flutes or something that creates magic in them. So it depends on where you are and what that intention is, because you may not want to do this to all of them, but if it happens to be a, a beam over where you sit on your couch, that's a primary one that I would want to work with. Exactly. And that's where you have, right? That's what I have. Yeah. 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 So now if you use the beam, like at the back side of your couch, then that line is, is equal with it. Right. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's just moving things up just a little bit. So you don't feel like you're being cut, but if you're feeling like you're being pressured down, when you're, it's an uneasy place to rest, you know, and you may feel okay resting there because you're used to it. But when you're kind of off that day, you feel unsettled there, then, then you might want to do something to help shift that energy. Um, let's say, um, just even adding something that's soft up there, Hmm. you know, some people use like chiffon material and they just kind of dance it back and forth or something. I, you gotta be careful of dust. I know know, a lot of people have dust problems, but especially when you have animals, (laughs) animals and I'm in a, I have my log cabin has 30 foot ceilings. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but I so, keep it dusted. But since yeah. you're not being totally underneath it, it's not yeah. like a low sitting one, then the energy can have a chance to move. Yeah, it's pretty high and open. Yeah, and you have a fan in there, don't you? Uh, In my bedroom. I, well, yeah, I have a ceiling fan. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. So when with that fan, then then that helps to keep the energy moving too. Even Even if it's still, it has the intention. Yeah. That's on pretty much all the time. (laughs) 
Well, we're okay. we're uh, talking with Natasha Ventner about yeah. Feng Shui, and we're going to take our uh, break here. And when we come back, we can start taking your questions. If you have questions about your environment, call into the show. You can also ask questions in the chat room. Um, but uh, the show continues in just a moment. Don't go away.
Welcome back, everybody, to the third and final part of Vestiges After Dark. We are having a wonderful conversation about Feng Shui tonight with our guest, Natasha Ventner. Uh, if you'd like to call in and speak with Natasha directly, ask her questions about your home, see what you can do to improve your Feng Shui, the number to call is 718-362-6380. That's 718-362-6380. Remember to enter pin number 855-4111 to get placed into the queue. That's 855-4111. I'll have that number up on the screen here in a moment for those of you on YouTube. And of course, you can ask your questions in the YouTube chat room as usual. More when we come back. Don't go away. You know, uh, Natasha, one of my cases that we had uh, quite a few years ago, and it's something that I've talked about on the show before, um, revolved around a room in the client's home that was all mirrors. It was yeah. actually a um, an exercise room that she had converted into a meditation room. Um, it seemed like a bad idea because it seemed to amplify everything and it created a lot of paranormal disturbances. Um, that were leaking out into the rest of the house. And well, the energy in there was crazy. It was crazy. And uh, it's all, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you're asking, like, it, 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 you know, that what it reflects is what matters. Well, what happens when it's just reflecting infinity in every direction? Because they're literally floor to ceiling, including the back of the door, was a mirror. So there was nothing in that room that was not mirror. Wow. <laughs> 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 It was like a Faraday wow. cage. It yeah, was, yeah. Because actually, um, mirrors can be a way of opening up through dimensions if you if you believe in doing that. Yes, yeah. right. so it, she it definitely did. This, this client yeah. definitely yeah. did. Yeah. And so with that, that, that's also, if you open up the doorway one way and you're not sure about, you know, spirit likes to walk through the back door a lot. Mm, so... Yes. It will sneak right back in if you allow it to do that. And you have to be careful of that kind of thing. So that's why I'm saying be careful what you reflect. Like um, in the – I was checking out the the, um, the comments, and there was one person mm -hmm. who saw her mom pass away in a mirror. Right? Yeah, I've got that actually written down as a question. Yep. Yeah, because of the fact that, that she saw that. Now, items don't necessarily always hold energy, yet our memory – helps energy that item to hold energy yes so we have to be careful how we do that so if she's still struggling with that mirror being in her house i would get out get it out sit in a neutral place in the garage let it rest for a little while mm -hmm. right and then if she really likes the mirror cleanse it you know you know do some saging whatever you need to do to cleanse it Shift the energy of it. Keep it in that neutral place for as long as you, you need it to be. Then try it in another part of the house. I would not put it back in that air, that same place. I see. 
And then if it still has that memory, I would get rid of it. It, it just, it, it's too strong of an energy. Let somebody else create new energy with it. Yeah, we've had several cases involving mirrors. With just that. Well, there was actually the very first case that that I did after joining the Order of Exorcist. The very first case I had. This was the one in Alabama that I uh, told you about. Yes. Um, that one um, revolved around a very large ornate mirror that she was keeping underneath her bed. And yeah, I, I, I knew you'd have that. Would reaction. that be problematic, Natasha? I'm just wondering. I knew you'd have that. <laughs> For frick's sake! So okay, we, so no words needed, right? No right. words we're, needed. We're all in agreement that that's not a good idea. Well, let me tell you what happened. Wow. So we we pulled that sucker out. Now this was on our second. We didn't know it was there the first visit. We were trying to get to the bottom of this thing, and and this this was an old, big old house, and it it had stuff everywhere. There was twenty cats living in this house with her. Um, and it, it was a lot of stuff going on. Um, but when we came back the second time, um, she d revealed that there was a mirror there and, um, we pulled it out this very large giant ornate mirror. And she even said that she felt that, that, that this was given to her because the person, uh, that gave it to her was a witch and put a hex on it. I said, well, why are you putting it under your bed for goodness sake? But anyway, um, I, I took the mirror out I, and, I, and I blessed it with holy water. And this was the interesting thing. And everybody on the team saw this. Um, the holy, holy water would not reflect in the mirror. Wow. So you'd mm -hmm. see it dripping down the mirror, but you couldn't see it in the reflection because you know, there's like that little space between yeah. yes. you, you couldn't see it reflect only the, only on the front part, which was interesting enough. And then I said to her, I said, how attached are you to this mirror? And she said, um, well, I mean, she says, I don't, whatever you have to do, do. I said, well, do you mind if I take it out back and smash it? And she says, if that's what needs to happen, then, then I'm okay with that. So I took it out back and I smashed the thing and it was a shame to do too. Cause it was a very nice ornate, probably antique, but there was so much it bad has, energy it needed yeah. to go. And you know, her situation improved almost immediately after that. There were other things that we needed to work on because there was a lot going on in that case, but that was certainly was one of the primary problems with her attachments. So, uh, what are you, what are your thoughts on all that? <laughs> Well, for one, it depends on what way the mirror is facing. Now, like my kid, who was very intuitive, mm -hmm. slept above the bathroom down below. Okay. So what, what I did was I took, there's there's a Bagua mirror that's the, the eight-sided mirror, right? Uh -huh. And I turned it upside down. So the, the energy of the bathroom below was being reflected back on the plumbing that was underneath the bedroom or the underneath, you know, in between the, the floors was free being reflected back down so that my kid wasn't, wasn't, um, uh, absorbing the energies coming up. Interesting. Okay. So you can use mirrors to a benefit, but I sure as heck would not turn that mirror upside uh, the other way up. Yeah, it was, it was resting on its back. So the reflection part was facing where she was sleeping. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> and then we had the mirror. Remember the teaser reel we filmed where entity, we, with the SLS, we filmed the entities jumping out of the mirror and That's jumping right. on me. And yes. we, the client, the they, client they, it's had. A, I remember that. Yeah. She had opened a portal it, by scrying. Yeah, exactly. So that's where, again, let's go back to that first moment of conversation you had at the end of the, the first hour and the beginning <laughs> of the other. Do not play with something you don't have the tools of negotiating with. Yeah, yes. she was very Now, I work dumb. with demons. Yeah. I work with darkness. But I also know who to call in to help me. Right. Yeah. I know who, I know how to, you know, as dark as it is, you need to have as much light Yes. You know, and balance it out. And, and you have to understand what darkness you're playing with. That's true. You know, or negotiating with, because not all darkness is that evil darkness, but yet you have to understand what you have. And, Most of it is not. And, Most of it's not mm -hmm. that satanic kind of darkness, you know, that people equate Depression with evil. Is dark. Oh, absolutely. And that's the majority mm -hmm. of it. It's fear, sadness, depression. sorrow, and fear. Those yep. are the biggest darknesses that people are going to encounter. And those are the... Uh, most prolific demons, in my opinion. 
thank you for saying that <laughs> because energy Facts. can create a being. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Whatever that being is. And there's sometimes where I, you know, I talk about people's emotions and, and it's like, and I treat them as they are beings yeah. because they have that much influence on somebody's life sometimes. Well, they're sentient. They, they mm -hmm. are sentient in and of themselves, which is a being. I mean, mm -hmm. what else is a being? I mean, we, I mean, we, we kind of get, I think we split hairs over things like we think of a being as only like a human, you know, um, some kind of physical creature that is intelligent. But, um, you know, that's not the metaphysical definition by a long shot. Uh, no. You know, being, beings are lots of different types of things and most of which are non-corporeal and and this is where we get into the power of the human uh mind to generate to create because it is part of its nature you know that's i think you know i tell people all the time i don't know if i've mentioned this to you natasha but i uh, i know my audience has heard me say this to death but you know this is what the bible means when it says that we were made in god's image it doesn't mean that god looks like us it means that we uh have the characteristics of being a creator we create by our by our nature so if we're depressed <laughs> oh, and miserable yeah, yes yeah <laughs> So if we're yes. depressed and, and, and miserable, then we have the power to actually turn that into a thought form that can go out and literally become an external attachment that will torment us on the outside. And people are like, where did I pick up this demon? Well, it's like you created him. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So let's go back to that moment of if somebody has depression or darkness. For one, I would really make sure that if I was going through a very depressed moment if you can have the energy to do this i would wash your sheets every week mm. if you can yeah get that energy I, yeah. nightly i would take the pillow and shake it out yes we process a lot in our in our brains when we sleep mm -hmm. and our pillows hold the energy I would also ask you what do you have around the head of your bed what does your nightstand look like is it cluttered? For me, I have stones. I have amethyst and I have citrine that are at the head of my bed. And actually, I took them underneath my my front pillow that I have because that's what I I like to have the the protection of amethyst and the clarity of citrine that helps me process through my the negativeness that I deal with daily. Mm -hmm. You know, not my own negativeness, but the negatives that that you know that my subconscious would like to hold on to sometimes. You sure. Know? Yes. And, and, you know, it's one of those things. So what do you have around you? What do you have underneath your bed? How, if you have, like for me, I look in my closet next to my bed. So I have everything organized towards colors because to me, then when I wake up in the morning, I see um, creativity. I see order. Yes. It's not perfect by any means, right. but it's, it has an orderliness to it. So if I'm not waking up to disharmony. Right. Okay. And then... Going back to where do you sit during most of your day? If you have a, a, a recliner that we sit in most of the day and we're feeling depressed, have we sh have we gone into that that chair and pounded it out? Have we clapped? Have we rang a bell? Have we done something to shift that energy? Mm, okay, yeah. Also, too, what do we have around it? What do we have underneath it? You know, sometimes we have our chairs backed up to like the back door. Well, what do we have behind that chair that creates negativity? Right. What do we see out in front of us? You know, like, um, like sometimes, like for me, if I don't water plant and it's looking kind of whoopy, you know, that's what I'm looking at is whoopy, you know, plants. And so I need to tend it or get rid of it. Because it's better to have nothing than something that is is more, you know, if we're always looking at dirty dishes, then we're going to have a dirty dish life. I think that's what I like about my new home. Um, I moved into this home about a, a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, maybe, maybe 11 months. Yeah. Um, and in this new house, it's a much larger home. And the living room where I spend a lot of my recreational time um, – and I sit in my favorite recliner um, to my back is, is a very large window. That's two stories and it overlooks the property. And we sit in the center of, of 20 acres of just woods. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all woods around behind me. And then to the right uh, is another large door uh, that, ex- that that opens to the outside that is all woods. And then on the walls, it's it's tapestries of of magical creatures. Um, and it really does create a very, uh, uh, peaceful it's and comforting. it is very, and com- once you got it all set up, yeah. because when we first went through the house and you're showing me and it, when it was empty, yeah. it was kind of just dull, but, yeah. it, but once you got decorated, it is, it's a different very, environment. Very comforting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I didn't do it with feng shui in mind. I just did it with, because I'm like you, Natasha, I, I feel energy. Um, so I won't really don't need to, 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 uh, cognitively process a a method. I just feel this is what needs to happen. And at my other house, um, I stayed in way too long because I just hate moving that much. Um, we had outgrown it and it was becoming more and more cluttered with years and years of accumulation. Um, add to that the fact that I've been operating the church out of my home for a long period of time, which is another entity. And I run my secular business uh, from home. So there's a lot of stuff that you accumulate when you've got all these various things and your mm-hmm. own life and a child and everything else. Um, so it, it, having all this space now has made it possible. We have one room of clutter, which is the storage room that actually rests underneath uh, the the front porch. So I think, I mean, energetically, that feels like the perfect place for to, to stash your clutter um, because I don't have any, there's nothing there. It goes underneath the earth and um and then it, it you step on over it and then once you enter into the house itself where you live it's not there anymore so um energetically it feels right um but it's it's a storage room so there's only so much uh, organization you can have in there but it's not, it's gotten a lot less cluttered i've thrown out a lot of stuff now that i have the space to be able to move boxes you can actually walk in there you can walk yeah. in there and it's organized in a way that i can find things um so it's not terrible but that's really the only clutter we have now everything else is very organized and Mm -hmm. and and i don't have anything in the living spaces that is not there uh for usefulness there's nothing there that's just there and accumulating like it was at the other house no and congratulations on that because that makes a big difference because i would say that you know with having the storage underneath the front door well the front door is how you enter your life Right. Mm-hmm. So if you're feeling like that, you're not getting your footing or that things kind of keep slipping away and there's disorganizing this around you, that it's not necessarily in the front of you, but it's just like this understuff. Like, why can't I get motivated to get this done? And why can't I do this? And why well, is it that things this- start, keep starting, but they don't finish through? You know, if you kind of get that that area kind of more cluttered up. I would say in disharmony Mm -hmm. because I understand there, there you can have things and, and have it organized and it doesn't have the same feel. Right. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, that's where, if you notice, like for me, you know, like if I notice my relationships getting a little wonky, I'll dust my relationship corner and then I'll go out and weed that area of my yard. (laughs) Okay. Right. Right. Then it kind of just fluffs it back up again. And then in my humanness, I have to make sure that I, I pay attention to that detail. Right. You know, so it's that it's the physical application, but then in the humanness, I still have to, I'm still responsible. Yes. I gotcha. Okay. You know, type of thing. What do we have for questions from the audience right now? Uh, Jamie or Brandon, anybody got a question? She answered one of them. Mystic also had another one where she was asking about sinks. Sinks. Uh, Because they have drains in them. So what would you say about sinks? I guess maybe in the bathroom, in the kitchen. Um, Is there something you should do around sinks? Sinks are something that you... Yeah, sinks, I would be careful of where, like if you if you walk in your front door and all of a sudden you see your sink or there's a window, I would see how you can do kind of like what I talked about with the toilet, kind of slow down the energy. Sinks aren't as bad as like toilets, but they, they do have an energy flow going down. Mm-hmm. So I would make sure that whatever you have, like when you walk through my front door, I have a, a window and then I have, um, and I have, but I have something on the windowsill and then I have a, a window, a, a kind of a chime that has small grid mirrors on them 
to help that energy to f- keep flowing. Cause I have kind of a weird energy place. This house was not meant for feng shui. So if <laughs> I didn't feng shui this house, this house, we would have been in trouble Yeah, because Uh-oh. it's like, it, it it's the only thing that settles the energy of this property is because it's so disharmonized by the way it was made that it, the feng shui is the, is the blessing that it can have. If that makes any so, sense. So, you okay. know, pr- prisoners are really in trouble then because I mean, I'm just thinking about all the things you just said there in a prison cell is like the first thing you see when you walk in is the toilet and the sink above it. Right. And then you got all these yep. bars everywhere, which can't be good. And then you really can't bring stuff in to help the environment. So it's really like, you know, the worst feng shui you could possibly get that you can't correct would be like a prison cell, I think. Exactly. And you probably notice that that let's say the the people who are able to do drawings. Mm hmm that their cells feel totally different than yeah. somebody who, who has more anger and frustration in there. Yes. Yes. That would make sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I worked in a jail for five years and that, that would so, be true. Well, that's yeah. a good point because what about people that are employees, you know, having their work environment where they spend most of their time is in an environment that is probably the furthest thing from, good feng shui as possible and not much that can be done to improve it so is there something that can be done um to the self so that when you have to work in an environment that is less than ideal that you can manage that energy is there something you could do on your person that's where having a spiritual belief system in your core can help. Okay. I also support my life by wearing rocks. You'll always see me wearing stones Mm -hmm. or, you know, I I have stones on my finger. I mean, I always have stones with me. I also have a, um, I also have a protection that is universal, which is love. I put a bubble of love around me and it has some tough love in it when I need it. (laughs) Right. So, um, I use bubble love. So you need to have those, those self awarenesses, but I would wear some kind of talisman that like for me, there's sometimes where I'm having a rough time and I put a rock in my pocket and I just keep rubbing it. So it reminds me to come back to me instead of being my environment. Are there certain stones that are better for this than others? There is. There is. What was that? Is it what, hematite, onyx? Um, I may be wrong. Citrine. It's, it's, it's a black, um, black stone. Uh, onyx is the black stone. I mean, yeah. yeah, any, actually, any stone is good. There is some better for some things and some better than not. But I would say if you pick up, like I even have just regular agate rocks that I pick up out of the playground that I walk around with me because they were what I needed. Mm hmm. So let the, let, let your intuition, we all are intuitive. Let that intuition say, Oh, wait a minute. I got to pick up a rock and, and, you know, and carry it with me for the day. And then sometimes I just drop it back off out in the yard again, because it did its job with me that day, Hmm. you know? So it's not necessarily people try to make it harder than it is, Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, and it's also a mindset. So now let's say like I work in an elementary school with 400 kids that, you know, if you have anybody has been in the school system lately, they know that it's not necessarily easy. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And, and so what I do a lot of times when I get out, I clap my hands around me, you know, get that energy. energy. Shush all that stuff away from you. Yeah. You you do that with the incense sometimes. You know, a little clingy, you know, um, that's where sometimes before I even drive away, I sit there and I just breathe for a little while, become neutral so that I don't carry it home. Right. And that's the thing is, is that a lot of people don't stop from one thing to another and that's energy too. Yeah. So, you know, and you were saying about feng shui. Feng shui is about what feels right and what feels wrong. Right. If something feels off, then it's the then you know that you're not doing the feng shui that you need to do. Right. And it, or doing the chi energy. So it's not a basically about you know I got to read the book now about feng shui and do right and wrong. And yes, there's more rights than wrongs. You know, with how to do things. But at the same time, though, if it doesn't feel right, it could be the right picture. But if that if that picture just feels off to you, then it's not the right picture because it's all about how you feel with the things around you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Brandon, have you seen a question that uh, should be answered or do you have one yourself? Yes. 
Go um, for it. <laughs> both, yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I have a lot of questions, but there have been quite a few in the chat. Uh, one of them I saw was from Paula. Uh, mm -hmm. If there are no objects in the individual grid spaces, could that be problematic? I would say in my understanding, yes. I helped my girlfriend. She, I, we walked in her room and there was no color. Mm -hmm. And she was wondering why she didn't have any passionate Nick things in her life. She had a hard time getting the energy to move forward. So we purposely found a couple of things on sale, you know, to, to put like a little bit of color on the walls and, and pictures on the walls. And when she walked in, she goes, ah. you know, she had that inspiration. So I would say that, you know, if you're a minimalist, it's okay to be a minimalist, but sometimes it's better to have just something like a nice picture on the wall or something that represents that area to bring more, um, more prosperity into that area. Sure. Yeah. You know, so if you have nothing in your helpful people, wonder uh, helpful people corner and you wonder why you don't have any friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, my, we like, my wealth corner in my bedroom is completely empty. So I'm going to have to fix that. <laughs> yes. And it's not about, it's not about, um, put dumping whatever we can put it there, right. but it's about how do you negotiate that story? You know, that makes sense. for me in my, in my bedroom, because you, in your bedroom, you want to have it more neutral. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to have a bunch of waterfalls. You don't want to have a bunch of things like that. So what I have is I have a, a chest that I got from my cast iron pans that has discovery on it. I have coins and, and different things inside that chest. Mm -hmm. Then I have on top of it, I have, um, I have mother Mary statue. And then I have a, um, a Christmas cactus because mm -hmm. the links Jades and Christmas cactuses are really good because they have links. Okay. You know, they're building on and, and Jade has the money look or yeah. you can get a money plant. They're kind of fickle though. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, and then I have that, that's, that's, you know, may, I make sure that stays healthy because I want my prosperity to be healthy. I also have a picture of dragonfly fly. And I also have a picture of a heart with multiples of colors with um, butterflies in it. Okay. So, I've, I've added some colors and I, I've had to negotiate my money scenario with my, when my parents passed away, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, but I had a, I spent money. That was the way I dealt with my grief for a little while. Well, yeah, we and all have so our I wanted things, to right? fix that. I, I'm in the process of still fixing that. Yeah. And so I, um, so I have that heart with the butterflies so I can transform my belief in what I know about my money. So it's really, it's an archetypal language. You're, you're, you're applying in a very practical way uh, the language of archetypes using these innate symbols that speak to us on these deeper subconscious, perhaps even unconscious levels to uh, produce an effect. So it's really the principles that magic is based on. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing. It's, it's like making your related. making your environment a magical place is what we're doing here. Exactly. So, you know, it, it is about what feels better to you. You mm -hmm. know, if you're having problems with things, check your environment. So, Brandon, did you have something else that you, another question? Yes. Uh, another question came from the chat. Uh, can you please explain the importance of color? Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> so different areas have a different um, element and color. So when you have Every area should have the five elements in it, you know, wood, metal, um, uh, you know, glass can represent water, um, mirrors can represent water, you know, right. so you mm -hmm. want the elements, you know, air, you want to make sure air is moving, right? Mm -hmm. So having the elements in it can help with the process of your intention. You know, it's another layer to helping things move better. So let's say with my health corner in my bedroom, I have a picture of um, the, a green because green is the color of the health. Right. So I have a picture of a of a pink roadie with light shining on it through the forest. 
it's an it's a wild roadie in the forest so it's mm. about standing tall with the trees but then having life building on it right 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 so color can have a huge understanding of the intention you're on it's more like an honoring of that area so like let's say if you have a bright red area uh bright red something in your helpful people kind of corner which is more the darks and grays right that's okay but at the same time though you would want to have something that's dark and gray Okay. You know, you would want to have something to honor it. Um, but color, sometimes you want, sometimes you want to pop a color to add life to it. You know, you want to bring life to it, but yet you want to have something that honors that intention so that the, 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 the flow has honor through it instead of like, oh crap, I didn't, yeah, I'm a little out of balance here, you know, <laughs> you know, because maybe if you put a lot of metal in the wood area, then you're going to, then you're going to have like an out of balance feel that elements not wanting to be honored per se. Elementals are very important, by the way, people don't give elementals fire, water and air and, you know, credit like they should. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I have a story about that, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) How do I mean, and it's different in the Chinese because they, they add like they have the metal and the wood, right? That's, um, Different than the the Western system with uh, the um, earth, um, air, fire, and water in the West, but in in the East you have um, wood, metal, um, water, uh, wo- air, air. Mm-hmm. So they they just kind of they 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 duplicate they they expand I guess upon earth with the metal yeah, and the it's wood a, it's a little bit of a different language but yeah. at the same time though because they really work with dragon energy there which is earth right you know? yeah so they use they use their energy a little bit different than what we would you yeah. know in the sense but i i use dragon energy too in the same in a lot of the same intentions sure um well, my god uh, my whole house is made of wood <laughs> <laughs> i need, so I need some more metal it's more metal. Yeah, it's exactly. Metal. So then you would want to make sure that you do have more metals or like for me in my, um, my, uh, that's what the guns are for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like Swords. I have a fireplace in a my fireplace. knowledge corner, mm-hmm. but we don't use my fireplace a lot. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll put a candle on top of the fireplace, which is metal. And then I have brick, which is earth. And then I have wood is is the mantle, right? But I don't have much water and I don't have much fire there, even though it's a fireplace. So I do a candle. And then what I do is I have a pot that I put on top of my my wood stove, you know, the old style pots that you can put on for humidity. Oh, yeah. And I keep water in that so that there's that natural water that keeps going. Because okay. I don't want to put a bunch of water around the fireplace because that fireplace is a natural fire. And I don't want the mm. elements to fight each other, but right. I want to honor it. Right. A lot of, uh, I mean, you'll see a lot of uh, Chinese places of business putting a fountain up front. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that to draw energy in? Is it to, uh, what, what would you say is the benefit to that? So for me, like when I walk out my back door, I have a pond and the waterfall is flowing towards the back door. Okay. Because I, wa- I want the energy n- to come back to me. Right. I see. And so you don't want necessarily like a waterfall to be facing away from your door. You want it to be like, let's say, off to the side so that at least when you're coming in, you're feeling the flow of the water coming towards you. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, Brandon, you Listen. said you had some questions of your own. Um, and it's kind of opening a can of worms when you ask Brandon this, but I mean, <laughs> go, I, I think we, uh, let's hear what you got. Uh, Cause I'm sure you've got some good ones. Uh, so, so I do. Um, I want to preface the, the, my first question by saying that I'm about to move into a new house, uh, my own room. And I'm kind of wanting to get more into the feng shui, uh, Zen type of thing. Mm-hmm. But my uh, first question is, since the four elements have their own cardinal directions, like north, south, east, west, do you have to put, say, uh, a plant in the north part of your room? Like, do they have to go in their exact 
I would say, I would say it's not about what it is. It's about what is the intention of it. So now I'm asking you, would you like to do the feng shui that is of the um, compass style? Or would you like to do it the way that I do it, where it's the room, the where you walk into a room? Because if you want to do it with the compass style, the north, east, south, and west, that's where those colors have that intention, right? Where with me, I do it with how it, you walk into the room. So even if you're the, the, the head of the, the, um, the let's say the head of the, the room, when you walk in the farthest part of the room is to the south, it doesn't matter north, south, east, or west. It just, mem- it just matters that that far corner to the right is your relationship. The far corner to the left is your prosperity. So with that, that it's not about north, south, and east, and west. So you're sounding like you want to do the compass style. So I would really study those intentions. Okay. And I am not apt to that. I have to read my books too, to know how to negotiate those stories. I know that there's some that would, some of that would lay over, but I have not studied that. So I don't have that knowledge in me at this time. Well, it I sounds apologize. like your method, Natasha is, is more versatile in the sense that you, you practical, you've yeah. got more ways to work with it. Whereas it sounds like the compass method would be more limiting. It's more, um, it's more, it's more, uh, um, uh, right brain, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you, you know, yeah. and I'm total left brain. <laughs> I got to I got to go with what feels right. And to me, when I've walked onto properties, the house asked me to do this style. It's not about north, south, and east, and west. And I think it's because I like to work with the ley lines yeah, more yeah. than I like to work with um, the north, south, east, and west. To me, ley lines have more importance than the north direction. Even though I honor the north when I do my um, my uh, when I do the uh, the when I walk my circle, you know, sure. I do I do understand the west is about releasing. The north is about um, coming into home. The east is about beginnings. The south is about getting going in the fire in our life, right? Right. So I do honor it that way, but I don't honor it in the way of north, south, east, and west when I'm doing feng shui or house blessings. Oh, makes sense. Makes sense. Did that answer your question a little bit? Uh, really, that did. And it brings me to a, uh, another question. Uh, is there a difference? Because I, I recently found the term uh, Zen. Mm-hmm. So is there a difference between Zen and Feng Shui? Zen is a state of mind. Feng Shui is a state of being. That's a good way to Could put it. Have said that any better? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That wasn't me. That was you pulled, my... you pulled that right out of the ether. <laughs> that just came to me. Sound. Well, Zen is is sort of a uh, a minimalist form of Buddhism, whereas Feng mm-hmm. Shui is more of an extension of Taoism. It's more of a, a an applied Taoism. So you know, Taoism is very Chinese. Um, Zen originated in 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 china too but it really grew its roots in japan um so you know it it it, 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 philosophically they're different in the sense that uh, taoism is very much with energy flow and you know working with energy and taking it within um, yourself and understanding it and how it leads to certain realizations Whereas is Zen is more almost a negation of energy. It's almost about extinguishing energy um, mm-hmm. to bringing yourself back to a stillness point. So um, they both kind of achieve the same, the same thing, the which same is the thing, irony yeah. of it. Yeah. Like people get very Zen in yeah. my spiritual room. Sure. Because, but I'm, my room is feng shui so that it can bring the, the, the quietness, the peacefulness mm-hmm. to bring in the Zen moment. Yes. Does that, does that explain it a little bit more? It does to me. Yeah. A little, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When, once you start practicing what Zen really means then it's like Zen is that thing when you sit in your recline, your chair that you love to be in quiet and all you see is tranquility around you. That makes sense. Yeah. Because if you see chaos around you, you're not going to have a Zen moment. Oh no. no. And that's why I love about those little uh, rock gardens, you know, that, you know, those Zen gardens, you know, mm-hmm. where they're just, mm-hmm. 
uh, I mean, there's something artistically pleasing about that. It's it's more than just symbolic of peacefulness. There is something that that viewing such a arrangement does to the mind. It 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 sort of calms the mind and puts it into that reflective state so that it can be it's more conducive to uh, channeling that kind of peacefulness so Mm -hmm. uh, anytime i see i don't know i've always loved i mean they they, they even sometimes you see them you don't really see them that much anymore but back in the 90s it was common to go into a bookstore or something they'd have those little portable zen gardens uh, yeah that you could just put on your desk and you could like had a little rake that you could move the sand around and yeah like those are like the uh, the bonsai trees the bonsai trees yeah, yeah. Well, it's all related to the same kind yeah. of thing did we cover all the questions in the chat are there any that we missed i did not see any other ones brandon, brandon. do you see any others or do you have any of your own i do okay go for it uh so and, and i hope the questions i'm asking others have the same questions as well. I'm sure they uh, do. Mm -hmm. In terms of feng shui, uh, what do statues, like say, for example, a Buddha statue, what importance or significance do, do they play? They can play a very important role if you choose to allow them to have that in your belief system. So like for me, I have some Buddhas that I have. And some of them have this pose, right? And they're they're very much at peace, you know. And so I put them in very specific places for intention. Like in, in my bedroom, I have one in a certain place because that's my um, career. And that's what I do. So who am I? What do I do? So I want to have more of that Zen moment. Right. So if there's different poses, you know, that they have can create different intentions. And so if you know that you can set that intention in that area. So I would kind of look at what Buddha you have to create that intention, because, you know, anywhere you put it, it would probably be a blessing. But then you can magnify its energy with intention by putting it in certain areas, depending on what that Buddha represents. You know, it's interesting because <laughs> it's a common tradition in, in, in Catholic families to put a crucifix over one's bed. Yeah, but I would that think one. that's pretty bad feng shui for someone who's not Christian, you know, <laughs> because it's kind of a <laughs> difficult symbol if you don't understand the theological context in its entirety, you know, um, because, I mean, it's it's really, a, it's a execution it's a torture device uh it's an execution device uh it represents um at least historically death however um without the theology you know without the theology that's all it is with the theology it represents salvation and the ultimate peace but you have to have a connection Every to that death theology is a new beginning and it, that was the that was the ultimate death to new beginning exactly right. so if you understand that then i would imagine that that's a wonderful symbol to have over your bed but for somebody that does not connect or resonate with that theological system, that would you say that would be a problematic thing to have over their bed? It could be because of the fact that, and it depends on where it's at. So like my, over my head and my bed is my creativity area. Mm -hmm. So what I have is a drum that my husband actually, um, the deer asked it, you know, came to my husband. Um, and so that hide is made out of a deer that my husband ended up getting. And then I have, um, feathers. I have a, 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 a fan that I put over that. And so I have something musical that represents a circle, which is about u- the unity, right? Right. Yes. So you can have, but it depends on where you, where that, that bed is depends on what you kind of want to have, but you want to have something that it's over your bed. That's going to add some kind of tranquility, some kind of peace, some kind of knowing. Now I have my great grandmother's crucifix that is in my knowledge corner that I see when I sleep, I see. but it really represents to me family and um, that core belief that something greater is out there because mm-hmm. she wanted to be, she, uh, my grandma, she, she, she only slept with it. You know I mean? She literally almost slept with it, but um, it meant a lot to me. And so I asked for it, you know, to come to me. Sure. Yeah. 
Well, Natasha, we're at the end here. I'd like oh for you gosh, to have. Too fast. I know it goes always <laughs> too fast. That's why. You, when it's that's good, why it goes you, fast. You have to come back. You just have to come back yeah. for another one. Um, but I want to take the next two minutes or so for you to be able to share with the audience ways that they can connect with you, uh, speak with you, all your websites, all that stuff. Okay, so you can reach me at, um, I'm on all platforms pretty much. Natasha Venter AC is where you can find me. My YouTube channel actually has feng shui videos on it where I've gone through and, and helped people do it and I've I've added to that. So um, I have different videos to support people with the the basics of, of how feng shui can can negotiate that you can reach me at angelic clarifications.com that is on my website and i actually have a page for feng shui i can do feng shui vi- virtually or in home if you're local i can actually travel i love to travel so if you help me travel i would be glad to travel and help feng shui your house <laughs> you know because i i do enjoy this is my life calling is to help people yeah so with that that i am a practical feng shuiist i do not judge i actually love to help people just move their life, change their environment. And at the same time, a lot of times I do do a little bit of a house blessing or a house clearing. If I, if it's called to do that, I had one person who got some, some stuff from his dad who was a hoarder mm. and he was like, it feels like it's got stuff on it. And I cleansed it. And I said, now let's change your intention of what that stuff it means. Yes. You know? So I kind of do, do a little bit of work with, the people I'm with depends on what that is. I'm very much, I love to support people move forward, whatever that looks like. I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, that's really what, what spirituality is all about. You know, it's about Mm -hmm. moving forward. It's about moving into a state of improvement from whatever came before. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think sometimes people forget that They, they, they get lost in the dogmatism and the control of it and yeah. uh, that's the least of its thing in fact it's not really we all need about to learn that from each other yeah it is but yeah. thank you thank you <laughs> natasha i mean really thank yeah. you so much for sharing everything today this was such a fascinating Always i have no idea joy. what to expect really it's one of the areas of metaphysics i probably know the least about um so it was a learning experience for me and i found it absolutely fascinating so yeah, thank definitely. you well, thank you for trusting me. Cause like I said, I'm not, I, I, I have not gone through my master classes to do this, but I love to do the practicalness of it, that it is about, you know, shifting that idea. So, you know, Brandon, when you move into your new place, I would make sure that, that you claim that energy is yours, you know, make sure that that room feels like it's yours because ownership can make a difference in how you set into an energy. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Natasha, Thank let's you. definitely book you for next season. Okay. Well, absolutely. we got to keep the conversation going. <laughs> Thank you, I'd Natasha. Outstanding. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you. Dear. you. Thank Blessings you. All. Thank you. And for all of you out there, thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, You know, it's always a great, uh, just a great time spending it with all of you, learning these new things and finding ways to improve ourselves. That's what spirituality is all about. So I will see you out there in the ether. God bless everyone. God bless.